again, thanks for the opportunity to come visit with everybody today. Uh, we had a lot of discussions putting this program together whether this was going to be for you know a cow calf producer that was looking at backgrounding their own calves or whether a commercial stalker uh, operator you know so we may have a, a mix of several of you uh, with different backgrounds if we were in face to face i would love to uh, poll you and see who every, everyone is and, and and what your specific interests are but uh, as she said we're going to try to kind of give a little bit of a basic program and uh, uh, we can hopefully build on this and go more in depth uh, uh, over time. Uh, as she said, my name is Wesley Tucker. I'm from Southwest Missouri, uh, a livestock producer as well with, with the rest of you. So uh, that's, this is my wife and daughter. My wife is a veterinarian. Uh, some people will say that 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 was good planning for a cattle producer to marry a veterinarian. Uh, I will tell you, God sends us all the Hail Marys, though, because we will try till the very last. So anyway, but that's my family. Uh, we do uh, run quite a few cattle as well. And so one of the things uh, to, that we're going to be talking a lot about is this idea of, so if I'm a cow-calf producer, you know, do, does it does it pay me to background my calves to keep my calves longer uh, and that's going to be a lot of what we're discussing I, I, I will say I would like to say of course my daughter is 12 now so this is a pretty old picture but uh, I, I would like to think I was kind of an early adopter way back a, a, a lot of years ago of, of, of thinking about you know what is my grass most valuable uh, how, how can I get the most uh, reward from my grass and is that running more cows or is that taking the calves that I'm producing on the cows that I have and taking them to a higher value product so uh, that's kind of what we're going to be looking at here on the economics presentation you know anytime you ask an economist a question they're going to respond with it depends and, and and it does depend on your specific scenario and your specific situation uh, when i get to the finally to the end of this presentation i'm going to ask you you know what is your system because what your system that you have in place when you calve you know your how heavily stocked you are a lot of things like that play into this idea of can i make more money uh, by backgrounding my calves so this is the the slide that is a, the cool season growth curve uh, for a Missouri cattle producer and I think this slide I think as we think about throughout the day uh, not only with when I'm talking about the marketing and the pricing the valuing of, of value of gain but whenever Eric goes to talking about uh, the nutritional side of it and you know what what low cost feed sources do we have that we can feed these calves and things like this. I think this slide, in my opinion, if all of us speakers would get together and talk about it, probably influences your ability to uh, put cheap gains on calves and take advantage of uh, uh, adding value to them probably more than any other slide that we can put up because it just crosses over into the economics, it crosses over into the nutrition, it crosses over even into the health. It, it, it influences all of those. So this growth curve that we face bleeds over into a lot of different things. You know, if you think about the prices of the different weight categories of calves, you know, the blue lines, the three to four weight, the orange lines, the four to five. If you look at the last 15 years of calf prices uh, for the, all the different weight categories, this, this is what they look like. And of course, we all like to remember 2014 and 15. We probably would have been better off if we never had that. Uh, but, uh, you know, thinking about the space between those bars, uh, as I said, if I was in a room, I would ask everyone this question. How do buyers value cattle? Whenever I take my cattle to the sale barn and I sell them and the guys that are sitting there bidding on them, how do they decide how much they can spend on those calves, how much they, they will pay for them? And it's basically based on two things, what they think the sale price is going to be when they are done with them and what the cost of gain is, what it's gonna cost them to get there. So really those different, if I back up here, the, the, the spaces between those, the spaces between those bars are affected by these two things, what they think they're gonna be uh, 60 days or 100 days or however far it is down the road and what it's gonna to cost to get it there. 
So I've got a real example that I want to run through. If I have a 500 pound calf today that is worth $2 a pound, okay, I, I wish they were $2 a pound today, but they're, they're, they're not quite there. But if I have a 500 pound calf today that's worth $2 a pound, and I'm going to put an additional 100 pounds on that calf and sell it at 600 pounds, and I'll get $1.80 for it when it's 600 pounds, what is the value of my gain? Is the value the $2 that he's worth today? The dollar eighty that he he will be worth when I sell him, or the average of the two, a dollar ninety, or some real real low figure, eighty cents a pound. Well, if you just do the math, five hundred pounds times two dollars is a thousand. Six hundred pounds times a dollar eighty is a thousand eighty. That calf went up eighty dollars in total value, uh, for a hundred pounds. So your value of gain was eighty cents a pound. You now. If you can comprehend what the slides that I've just shown, you now know more than 95% of beef producers out there. Because I routinely get people talking to me and saying, well, if I put another 100 pounds on and calves are bringing a dollar 50, then that means I get another 150 bucks, right? No, because as we just showed, there is a space between those bars, a little thing called a price slide. And prices tend to go down as they get heavy, as cattle get heavier, don't they? And so, you know, what determines the the slope of that price slide? Well, here's some things that it's based on. It's based on the season. It, it, the, we will show that there's seasonal variations in those value of gain. The weight of the cattle, the the, the price slide affects uh, tremendously. Whether we're talking about lightweight cattle or heavyweight cattle, the price slides will will change. But the biggest factor, again, as we talked about earlier, is simply that cost of gain and number one, the price of corn. What a feedlot is, what it's gonna cost them to put additional weight on determines what that value of gain is worth. But I want you to realize it, the value of gain for putting additional weight on a calf is not the price it sells at because every pound gets worth less as it gets bigger. So I remember back in 2014, I was trying to have this discussion with a producer and he said, no, you're crazy. Cattle are bringing $2 a pound. So every pound I put on is worth two bucks. So I pulled out the, the weekly market report and, and showed him right here that a 550 pound calf was bringing 215, a 645 pound calf was bringing $1.95. You do the math, the 550 pound calf was worth 11.94. The 645 pound calf was worth 12.54. It went up $60 for 90 pounds, 67 cents a pound. They just could not believe it. But that, you know, realizing, realizing that price slide and what the value of gain is truly worth is really, really important for this discussion. Now, ironically, two months later, when I went to do a grazing school, I pulled that same, uh, same market report out to look at and at that time the value of gain between a 550 and a six a 630 pound calf was a dollar 31 so it does change it does change uh throughout the year and based on the factors uh that buyers are seeing i pulled yesterday's report just to see uh friday may 29th and ironically uh yesterday the difference between a 570 pounder and a 670 pounder was worth 67 cents a pound. So just, just realize that's how that works. So markets are efficient and uh, they work based on those costs to, as I said, kind of equate what buyers can afford to pay for cattle. This is an old example. This is actually, I think back from 09, but I remember when I first put this example together to show this, at that time in the middle of November, June live cattle were 85 cents a pound or $85 a hundred. And, I, and I've showed this slide probably for 10 to 15 years. And, and I've always said, well, I hope we never get back there. Well, boy, we got really close this year, didn't we? Uh, within the futures markets. But anyway, at that time, June live cattle were 85 cents a pound. So if you figured a 1300 pound steer at 85 cents, that was $1,105 that that calf would be worth whenever he went to slaughter. At that time, if the cost of gain uh, was 69 cents a pound, as I said, I think this was back in 08 or 09, then adding 700 pounds to a 600 pound steer would cost $483 at 69 cents a pound. So the $1,100 he would be worth whenever he went to slaughter minus the 483 it was gonna to take to get it 
there would be $622. So a $622 divided by 600 pounds, a buyer could effectively pay a dollar four for that calf to be at break even. Anyone want to take a guess what a 600 pound calf was bringing November 14th that year? A dollar three. Uh, another another example, uh, just a couple of weeks later, in the Nebraska markets, a 750-pound calf at that time was worth $99 a hundred, was bringing $743. A 550-pound calf was bringing 109 for $600 uh, dollars a head, essentially. The $143 difference in them divided by the 200 was seven, 71 and a half cents a pound for was the value of gain. Anyone want to take a guess what the cost of gain uh, being reported that week by DTN was? 71 cents. Again, these are old examples with old num numbers, but I put them together back in 09 just to show markets are efficient and I could do the exact same thing for today's markets. Uh, the, the markets are efficient. It's based on that you know what the cost of gain is highly determines that value of gain with another little factor in there that if people believe the market is going to go up or down. So you know Pete Bonds was the 2011 Stalker of the Year uh, award winner uh, a few years ago and, and and I just remember this quote that he he, he said in, in his article it was it's you know backgrounding or stalkers the whole idea of the value of gain is it's the margin between the cattle cost, what it costs you to put the gain on them, and what you sell them for. This isn't rocket science. It really, really is third grade math. What does it, what is the animal worth today? What's it gonna be worth, you know, 60 days or 100 days or however long I'm going to background that calf? And then what does it cost me? It, it really is third grade math. Now I want to look at the markets and talk a little bit about this. As I said, I'm going to hit really hard on what this value of gain is and how it changes throughout the year. So I started with extension in 2001. Okay, so at that time when I came in as a farm management specialist, uh, I looked back and here was the last decade of, of cattle prices, 1990 through 99. Uh, the, the black bar is the three to four weight calves, the green bar is the four to five, the reds the five to six, and the blues the, the six to seven weights. And you know, there was, there was a lot of things that we would talk about here. Calf prices very, very much peaked in the spring basically had a very steady decline all the way to the fall when they hit their bottom. And, you know, and, and, and as I said, if we, we were in the room together, we'd talk a lot more about why this is. Well, you know, spring calving, uh, you know, 70% of calves were, were, were born in the spring and were weaned in the fall. So that would be whenever they were at their lowest. Why would cal calf prices be higher in the spring? Well, that's when everyone wants to buy them and turn them out on grass and, and, and take advantage of all this grass we grow. So the, these market prices were very, very predictable. So if I look at the, the space between these, you know, and, and look at the value of gains on those, uh, they change throughout the year because if I was to look at starting with a 450 pound calf right here in October and sell him 60 days later as a 550 pound calf, well looky here, look at, look at my price slide is almost horizontal. It's almost horizontal. So what would that be? Well, the value of gain for starting with that 450 pound calf in October was 64 cents a pound. What if I started in the month of, let's say April here and sold that as a 550 pound calf in the month of June, look how steep that price slide is. So if I go to the next slide and look at that April, that market only paid me 37 cents a pound for that 100 pounds of gain. So if I take all of these and I put them in a chart, this is what it shows. These are, these are what your value of gains is for, for, for starting at a, a 350 or 450 or 550 and go into the next weight category. And what we found throughout the 90s was it, I mean, the value of gain was very, very predictable. The, the value was the lowest in the summer which, you know, again, the cost of gain is the lowest in the summer and the value of gain was the highest in the winter, starting out from when those calves were weaned going through to the next spring. Well, that kind of makes sense, right? 
I mean, it's going to be more expensive to feed those calves throughout the winter when we don't have grass. Uh, so it should, the value of gain should be higher in the winter. But using this, we were able to talk to, you know, to, to help people think about this whole idea of what do I do? How do I take advantage of these price slides uh, and how they change throughout the year to put the most value on my gain? Well, if I've got lots of, lots of grass in, this, in the summer, yes, I can put those gain on those calves, but it's not going to be worth quite as much as if I think about how do I stockpile my grass and maybe put gain on the calves in the winter. And, and, and how do I utilize that grass to the most efficient use for my operation. Flash forward about another 10 years and uh, I remember one time Eldon Cole asked me to go give a, a presentation down in southwest Missouri on you know should I wean my calves or not? Should, should I wean my calves or not? Is it really economical to wean my calves? So we kind of started diving into these numbers and I just because I was in southwest Missouri I took Joplin stockyards and I looked at uh, the first decade you know basically uh, November of 99 through October of 2010 and this was what the value of gains were for the different weight categories. So to go from a 350 to a 450, the market over that 10 year time period had paid me about 90 cents. To go from 450 to 550, the market had paid about 78 cents. From 550 to 650, a little less than 70, about 69 cents, 68, and then back up to 70. So again, I had to be able to put that gain on cheaper than these because this was what my value of gain was. But if we look at those, if we look at those uh, uh, prices for those different weight categories, th there's some differences from where it was in the previous decade. Um, we still have the prices for the lighter weight categ categories, you know, peaking in the spring and, and, and bottoming out in the fall, but we had this much more flatter much more flatter period. Yes, it peaked a little higher in the spring, but really once we got going, once grass got up and going, we, we didn't have that really steady decline throughout the summer until we basically got into September. And it was really ironic uh, from 2000 to 2010, we really had this hard drop off uh, once we hit the fall months. And so what this basically did was basically said your value of gain was much better uh, throughout most of the summer and still again in the fall, but as long as you kind of avoided this whole August, September time period. And I know even for my own operation in looking at how this, looking at how this dramatically dropped off, I even altered my calving window for based on this because I realized that the value of, of, of those calves beyond about July uh, uh, just really got got very, very low, low economic return from those. So I even uh, did some crazy things and took my traditional Valentine's Day calving that most of us do that we can argue whether that's spring calving or winter calving, but I even backed it up further into uh, the winter. And so my goal became to have all of my calves on the ground prior to Christmas day so that they all went to town uh, prior to the end of July and to avoid some of this. But this value of gain on taking advantage of this for these different weight categories became a lot of what we talked about. Look how wide those gaps are in the spring and how much closer they came together in the fall. And so it basically what this started doing is it started making our grass worth a lot more. Uh, look how flat that 550 weight category is and then the 650 category and 750 category climbing upwards. And so basically it became the heavier we could put those calves, uh, make them be in the summer, the more valuable it became to us. Just real quickly, you know, just thinking about that, just some people like numbers to see numbers in a different way. So if I look at, you know, a traditional weaning calf, the, the value of that, the value of that calf is, is gonna be the most valuable during these summer months versus the fall uh, and winter. And thinking about how to take advantage of that is, of that is a lot while we're talking. But realize, realize um, that looking at those, this, this is again, just the same chart showing the value of gain, not just the averages, but showing it over that decade. Look how it goes up and down. And so what on earth 
would make the heaviest category, which is the 750 to 850 weight, what would make it worth $2 a pound in the spring of 04? $2 a pound for every pound of calf I put on there was worth $2 a pound versus just a few months earlier, it was negative 40 cents. So a calf was actually getting worth less total value uh, every day of his life. What could possibly make that go from that big dramatic change in just a matter of a few months? What does it, anyone remember what was happening in November, December of 03? Well, there was a very, very famous Holstein cow uh, that was constantly being shown on the news. That was when we had a case of BSE happen, and it shocked the market and sent, sent value of gains negative for a time period. Once we finally got past that, they recovered and became positive. What would do the same thing in August of 2006, where a calf, every pound of calf, Calf I put on was worth about negative 70 cents. I was losing 70 cents in value for every pound I put on that calf versus just a few months earlier, I was getting a dollar 70 for those. Well, that was a year that we first started having the ethanol boom and we found that we didn't have, suddenly we didn't have a million acres of corn in summer of 06 that we thought we did. And so Economists like to call these exogenous variables, which is a big long term for basically just external factors. And one of the things that we saw in the decade of 2000 to 2010 was we had a lot more of these external factors that factored into the markets. Our markets in the de last decade, the, the 90s, 1990 through 2000 was very, very predictable. They didn't have a lot of these shocks, but early, you know, from 2000 to 2010, suddenly we started having all of these outside things that would pop in there that would totally make the market go one way or another. So, you know, one of the other quotes that they had in there was, you can make money in five years and then lose it all in the sixth. So realize that when I put up slides here about you know, value of gain and show that it's it's really good in these these summer months here and then make sure you get rid of them by August. That's on the average, but external factors can cause markets to go up or down really, really dramatically, okay? And so protecting your risk is something that becomes something we have to think about. And especially if you're going to be, you know, if you're not just looking at your own calves, but if you're looking at becoming a, a commercial stocker operator or something like that, how you control that risk and, and control that price makes a lot of difference because you've already bought that calf all right, you've got that calf bought, so you've got that locked in. Your cost of gain, you're trying to control to do the best you can, but we have very little control over that final price. So finding a way to control that risk, uh, whether it be some forward contracting, some LRP, which is the Livestock Risk Protection Insurance, things like this become things we wanna consider. And I will tell you size matters because most of those risk management tools are not available to small producers. LRP is, but forward contracting often isn't. Uh, the futures market isn't unless you have considerate size. The, the time that this really became evident to me was I remember back when we were starting to come out of the really high prices and prices were starting to come down, one of my producers uh, put put a, a group of his calves, this was in November, and he put a group of his calves that he was weaning on the video auction. I won't t say where, but he put them on the video auction at, at, at one of the sale barns. And basically, this was in November, and he put them on the market to weigh 850 pounds the following June. And those cattle sold on the video auction for $1.72 a pound uh, for the following June. So it's basically six months out. And at the end of that auction, I remember the auctioneer said, hey, I, I think I've got some of those uh, calves that's gonna weigh 850, Hadn't, didn't have them on the video yet, but said, I, I think I'm gonna have some of those calves that are gonna weigh 850 pounds in, in next June as well. I wanna put those on there as well. I wanna put a thousand head on there. And they brought a dollar 72. And then he piped up, no, wait a minute. I think I've got another thousand pounds, another thousand head of those calves that I wanna put on the video and sold that next thousand head as well. 
you know, that auctioneer may or may not have owned those animals at that point. But I, I, I my guess is he saw that as that is a good price for six months out and knew what he could turn around and buy those calves the next day at the auction barn for. And he was basically then locking in, locking in his value of gain because he was buying and selling on the same market. And that's what small producers struggle with is, you know, if I buy today, I've got a lot of risk between now and six months when I'm going to sell that calf, the market can change. Well, what forward contracting allows you to do is it allows you to buy and sell on the on the same market and basically lock in that margin. Then the only thing you've got to worry about is keeping your cost of gain in line. So just realize that size matters and being able to put these uh, groups of calves into a, a, a significant enough size to make a pot load opens up a lot of potential for you to being able to control your risk with things like forward contracting and video sales. But anyway, uh, I wanna look at now this last decade that we're just coming out of, so 2010 to 2019 essentially. And this is, this is our different prices of calves uh, for the last decade. They have changed. They have changed on average. Uh, we still, Still have that spring peak with really, really wide gaps between the different weight categories. We have a little bit more of a decline going down into, into the fall, uh, a little bit more than, than the previous decade where we were fairly flat. But we also kind of have this July dip as well. And, and the, the fall dip is still there, but it's not been quite so pronounced on the lighter weight categories. Now, once you get up to the, to the five to six and the six to seven, that, that dip does drop further down. So if I look at my value of gain those, you know, this is what they, they are on average through for each of the different months. And as, as Anita said, we're going to have these, have these charts and recordings and you can come back and look at this, or if you want to contact me, uh, my email will be at the end of this. I, I can send you some of this as well. But one of the most significant things when it, that jumps out at you, when you just look at this is our value of gains have uh, increased significantly. Uh, to go from a 350 to a 450, the value of gain for the last decade has been a dollar 54 pound. That's really good. To go from a 450 to a 550, a dollar two, 550 to 650, a dollar, 650 to 750, 97, and even going from a 750 to 850 pound calf, the market on average has paid me a dollar a pound throughout that time. But realize, figuring out how to take advantage of as those prices change throughout the year, look, look how much more valuable going from that 750 to 850 pound calf has been during the summer months versus versus those winter months. And this just makes sense when we really stop and think about it. You know, we all know that a finished calf, a finished calf uh, that's going to go to slaughter is worth a whole lot more value in the month of April than it is in the month of June, whenever we, the market just gets flooded with all those slaughter cattle, right? I mean, that's what we're going into right now, not just because of the pandemic, but we knew we were going to have this big wall of cattle that were going to go to slaughter uh, in the summer of uh, 2020 here anyway. So I did my master's thesis 20 years ago on how do we how do we speed up or slow down our cattle to, to where we can take advantage of that spring high? So a heavyweight calf is going to be worth more if he can get, go into the feedlot, you know, before we hit into late fall so that he can come out of the feedlot before they get in that big price drop going into the summer of the following year. And so this just affects all of these different prices. But Again, look how much higher the value of gains have been, which that kind of makes sense because our prices were higher, right? If you just take the average price for the last decade of a 350 pound calf, it was worth 700 bucks. A 450 pound calf was worth 857. So that went up $150 just in the average price. I'm showing this just to, just to, just to basically show going at these different prices these this value of gain from different angles but the value of gain for these lighter weight categories are really high and it stays high all the way up to about an 850 pound calf so if i just take those and i plot them on a bar graph and show it this this is what it looks like this is the value of gain for those different weight categories 
Now let's compare it. So the blue bars are the value of gain for the last decade compared to the previous decade, 2000 to 2009. And again, this kind of would make sense to us because our prices have been higher, but what is the most important thing that has been higher is the cost of gain. So if I just pull the Kansas feedlot data and look at, okay, from 2000 to 2009, a steer cost of gain was 59 cents a pound, a heifer cost of gain, cost of gain was 63 cents a pound, but corn was 315 and alfalfa was $103 uh, dollars a ton. So if I look at 2010 to 2009, we've essentially, steer cost of gains went from 60 cents essentially to 90 cents. It's went up a third, okay? Well, if I come over to my corn price, 315 to 492, guess how much that's went up? 35%. So 30%, you know, 33% up in cost of gain, my feed, feed costs went up 35%, essentially the same. So as my cost of gain has went up, so as my value of gain. So that, that makes sense to us, that makes sense to us. But this chart doesn't make a whole lot of sense when you first look at it. So this is taking those different, uh, this is the value of gain for those different weight categories, but just instead of breaking it out by the decade, breaking it out in three to four year time periods. So the blue bar is 2005 to 2010. The, the kind of orange bar is 2011 to 2014. And the gray bar is 2015 to 2018. So you can see the low value of gains from 05 to, to 2010. Then we jump up when prices went up because of the cost, uh, cost of gain went up and everything. We look at the, the orange bar and then the gray bar. But what's interesting when you look back at this is, because we're not just looking at the entire decade, the corn price for those blue bars was 338. The corn price from t for the orange bars 2011 to 14 was 598, but guess what? For 2015 to 2018, the gray bars, the corn price dropped back down to 344. So why is our value of gain still considerably higher than the cost of gain? And if we were sitting in, a, in the room, I would love to, to get the open discussion going about this but I think we're having some structural changes in our feedlot industry. And that is allowing uh, us to have a higher profit potential from adding more weight to those calves. You know, feedlots are changing. They don't like getting those, those smaller uh, balling calves into the feedlot. You know, one pin rider, yeah, I don't know what their exact ratios are, but they don't want pin, one pin rider to 2,000 calves anymore. They want one pin rider to 20,000 calves. And changes like that, they are, are valuing our gain out here. They're allowing us to make more money by taking advantage of the feed resources that we have to put those gain on those calves. So looking at, looking at those looking at those bars again and how they change, just looking at that value of gain, yes, it is still the lowest. It is still the, the lowest for the year during the summer, but it's not that horrible drop off that we used to have. But I will, I will continue to say our, our value of gain is the highest in the fall and the winter simply because we have those lows in the fall and we have those spring highs in the different weight categories. So one of the things that I think as we go throughout today, I think one of the things you need to be thinking about is what is my system, what is my system on my operation that I can either take advantage of really cheap cost of gains because I have extra grass or do I shift some of that grass to try to utilize it at a time that the market pays more for that value of gain? And, and I mean, just one example, just one example to think about. Uh, well, I'll throw out two. One is when do I calve? You know, when, when do I calve? Do I calve in the spring or the fall has some influence on this. The, uh, the other one is, do I maximize my stocking rate of cows or do I lower some of my cow numbers and raise my calves bigger and try to take advantage of even stockpiled fescue in the fall? Uh, do I try to make as much hay in the spring or do I try to stockpile more grass in the fall and, and, and grow calves out whenever I have 
uh, cheap grass that I can put gains on when no one else can. But again, beware of those exogenous variables, those external factors that I talked about. I show this slide up there just to uh, say, does anyone remember the fall of 2015? I do, I, I do very clearly because I, I was speaking with some of my extension colleagues showing this here a while back. Uh, we always have our big annual meeting uh, in, in late October every year. And I remember going to our annual meeting uh, that last week, essentially there of October and, and, and saying, I've got to go home and, and wean my calves whenever I get, I still had a lot of uh, traditional spring calves at that time. <clears throat> and I remember going home and telling my wife, I said, uh, Heather, I just, I said, I know it's time to wean our calves, but I really wonder if instead of putting them in the backgrounding lot, we should just put them on the trailer because I said, I'm really, really nervous about this market right now. I think we've got some correction coming. For once, you know, every now and then, what's, what's that old saying? Every now and then, even a blind hog finds an acorn. Uh, I, I was right, but guess what? I didn't do it because I still felt like I needed to do the right thing by my calves and, and get them prepared to, to go further down the road. So when I got home from annual conference, I weaned them. And uh, look at those two weeks. Look at uh, the last week of October uh, versus 60 days later. 60 days later, a 450 pound calf going to 550 was worth 57 cents a pound less than it was the day I put them into the lot. A 550 pound calf was worth 48.97 less and a 650 pound calf was worth 50 cents. So how good is my value of gain when the calf is actually worth less than whenever I put him in the lot total. Uh, I lost my shirt the fall of 2015. So again, external factors, not knowing what's gonna happen with the market in 60 days or 120 days, uh, realize, as, as I said, we can put together really good uh, uh, scenarios where I make money five years and then lose it all in the sixth if I can't control my risk and can't control my price. So I, I just throw that in there. But real quickly, uh, we have the University of Minnesota has what's called FinBin where you can go out there and you can look at whatever uh, commodity you want, cattle, corn, soybeans, whatever you want to look and, and different producers across the country put their financial records in there so that you can look at what we call benchmarking, see how you compare to other states. <clears throat> and I went out and ran a report right quick to look at what the average cow-calf producer has made in the last 10 years. So the average, the uh, cow-calf producers made $52 a cow, but if you look, the, in 2014, they made $499 a cow. Uh, so I said, well, let's do an Olympic average. Let's pull out the high and the low uh, for those 10 years and look at an eight-year average. Uh, that return to labor and management drops to basically 14 bucks. I did the same thing for a backgrounding operation and the, the net return uh, over that 10 year time period was 54.90 and I said, well, I gotta do the same thing. So let's throw out the, uh, the high year and the low year. Uh, it really doesn't change. It's still $52 uh, a calf was, was the return to backgrounding. And, and so just real quickly, you know, think about this. Well, the cow calf producer was making $14 a cow, which takes probably three acres. Uh, a backgrounding calf was, was making $52 a calf for maybe you know 90 days uh, I think was, was the time period looking here and maybe you know maybe one to two calves per acre possibly even depending on how how you're looking at that. Um, we put together budgets every year uh, and I just throw this up just to, just to show it's always interesting to me when we put together a winter backgrounding calf that's in a dry lot versus a pasture backgrounding calf. Uh, again, these are negative because we get criticized all the time for throwing everything but the kitchen sink in there uh, whenever we put together our budget, so they are negative. But just realize, I think it's always, I've been doing this almost 20 years now, and it's always interesting to show how much difference there is between a calf that you can have out on grass, consuming grass, and a calf that you have to have in the dry lot. And so I think that factors into what is your system? How are you going to take advantage of your grass versus it's really, really hard to compete with the feedlot uh, when it comes to buying feed. The reality is they can always buy feed cheaper than I can. So if I'm going to have to have this calf 
uh, in a dry lot, feeding them hay and grain, uh, to be honest with you, a lot of times uh, my cost of gain is going to be higher than theirs. And so sometimes uh, it doesn't work out. Now, again, if we're looking at it, if I'm a cow-calf producer, you know, everyone wants to say, well, okay, yeah, you want me to wean my calves and, and put additional weight on them, but is the market really going to pay me for that? Which I, I know Eric's going to talk a little bit, even not considering the premiums, the, the additional weight is, is worth a lot. But, you know, does the market give a premium for vaccinated and, and, and weaned calves? Well, it does. I mean, this was one of the first, this was one of the first, uh, um, studies done on this back, back around 2000, you know, on the superior livestock auctions. Well, they, they redo that every now and then. So superior went back uh, a couple years ago and relooked at that and looked at the higher value for those VAC 45 calves, you know, uh, they looked at basically about a little less than a million head of cattle that had went through their auction that year. Uh, and the premium was four to seven dollars a hundred weight or twenty to forty dollars a head. Oklahoma did a, a, a similar uh, beef study uh, a few years ago and they looked at about one and a half to three percent uh, higher value for wean calves going into there. Uh, the, the point that I want to make with this is there is no doubt if a cow calf producer weans their calves on the farm and gives them their shots, there is value added. They're gonna get less sick in the feedlot, they're gonna have better feedlot performance, all of those things are true. The question is, and I think this is why a lot of people say, well, I went to the sale barn and I sold my calves and my wean calves brought the exact same as the guy that just brought, brought them in and dumped them off. Well, there is value added by doing that, but the question is, do we capture that value? Do we truly have the reputation with where we're selling our cattle to, to know that they know that those calves have, have, have actually been treated the way we say they do? It always drives me crazy when I sit in the auction barn and I hear them come through, oh, oh yeah, weaned in, weaned in all the shots, weaned in all their shots. Well, what does weaned in all their shots mean? So one of the things I think we have to be very careful of is if we're going to take the time and expense of doing this, that we've got to work with those that are marketing our cattle for us to make sure that they know what has been done and that they will sell them. I've sold cattle uh, all over Southwest and Central Missouri through the years trying to see if there was a better market here or there. And I remember asking uh, a, a mentor one time, I said, tell me where the best place is to sell my cattle. I hear, well, heifers do better here and, you know, eared cattle do better here and yada, yada. I said, tell me where the best place to sell my cattle. And he said, the best place to sell your cattle is where the auctioneer will stop and brag on your animals and really certify what's been done to them. And I think that is really true. So we have to work on developing the relationships with those that we want to market our cattle for us if we truly want to capture that value. There is value created here. The, the only question is, do we, do we capture it? The other thing that I think is, is a really, really valid point on here of, of figuring out for, maybe not for you, but whenever I talk to groups of, of people, you know, this is the census data, Missouri census data, realize that 72% of our cattle operations in Missouri, you know, are one to 49 head of cattle. That, that, that actually represents about 30% of the cattle in Missouri. And I realize, you know, those smaller producers may or may not, you know, ha have the time or the facilities to take care of weaning and giving giving cattle their shots. Uh, I'll also say, you know, this is the this is our Missouri producers broke out by age. Thirty four percent of our producers are over the age of sixty five. Twenty six percent is between fifty five and sixty four. Uh, so you know, you look at that. Roughly two thirds of our producers are over the age of fifty five, and and I would actually argue that it possibly sometimes when I work with producers is even harder though to get these younger producers convinced to take the time and effort to background their calves because those of us in, in these age categories all have off farm jobs for the most part and it, it, the time becomes a bigger issue. But you know when I think about going back to uh, some of these smaller producers sometimes I think about my father uh, 
one of the best things I ever helped my dad get, my dad and I went together and got a set of scales uh, that he could drop down in his alley and see the weights on his calves. And, and I swear my dad would have run calves through the, through the, through the alleyway once a week uh, just to, just to see how they were gaining because he enjoyed, he'd always been a cow calf producer, but when we started weaning and backgrounding our calves, he just loved running them through the chute to see if what he was doing in his, in his forage program was working or not. And so I, I don't necessarily mean to say that all small producers uh, don't want to do this, but it is a question of are they set up? Are they set up with the facilities and the ability to do it? And realize too that, that those one to 49 uh, cow producers, uh, the green bar is how, what percentage of them is that's their primary source of income. So again, most of them have some other source of income uh, and, and the cattle is are a really good wealth accumulator. And I hate to use the word hobby, but they're, they're a side business. They're not their primary source of income. So sometimes trying to convince them to do some of these things, income is not the driving factor, unfortunately. Uh, again, I talked a little bit about controlling risk. How do we control that risk makes, makes a, you know, a really important factor in this. But again, I, I just show up a picture of a shoot. Uh, a lot of our producers don't even have one of these. So there's a reason why in Southwest Missouri, we have lots and lots of intact bull calves go through the sale barn. Uh, it's because a lot of people just don't have the ability to do this. Um, I don't know if they're gonna talk about fence line weaning. And I know we talk about whether, whether that is a good or a bad thing and, and, and things. But one of the things I would say is I've weaned calves. I've weaned calves uh, multiple times with just going in with nothing more than a barbed wire fence and uh, put, putting up a uh, one, one high tensile wire in, in front of that barbed wire fence and being able to wean my calves across the fence from their cows. Now that's not what's happening here, but I just showed this picture just to say that. Uh, show this picture just to say I, I, I have a, a colleague of mine that uh, runs about 25 cows and he said, you know, he said, I'm, I've been listening to what you say about the economics of these calves and he said, I'm thinking about uh, getting rid of my cows and getting twice as many calves and, and, and just bringing them in and background in calves. He said, how do you think that would work for me? And I said, well, one of the things is uh, you don't have facilities. You, you know, you're not talking about backgrounding your own calves. You're talking about going to the sale barn and buying calves and bringing them in and dumping them out on your, your farm. I said, you have to realize you need facilities to be able to do that. And he's like, well, I've got really good perimeter fences. And, and I show this picture just to show that I had brought calves in from about three different rental farms and dumped them in here on the home farm. And I took, snapped this picture just because I was really, I was really uh, wanted to show my mother that I'd actually got every calf in the lot and at least looking at the feed bunk on the first day. I was, I was so excited about that. And, uh, then she sent me this picture uh, a couple of days later that uh, you can't see this, but this wooden corral here went all the way down to this gate on the ground was hanging on that wooden fence. And so I don't know what spooked those calves, but they basically, of course, the posts were rotted off or they wouldn't have fallen down, but those calves just totally destroyed that corral that night. And so I went down, put put portable panels back up, put the corral back up. And then a couple of days later, they went through the other side. I don't know what was getting in and spooking those calves, but I, I show these pictures just to, to show my colleague and say, look, you know, there's a big difference between weaning your own calves and bringing calves in from some strange place and sticking them in there. You've got to have some facilities and some ability to be able to take care of them. Now, thankfully, there's those calves out on grass, and once they got out on grass, they were fine. But, you know, again, what is your system? Not everyone is set up to be a commercial backgrounder. I think everybody can, can, can basically figure out a way to background their own calves. But to be a commercial backgrounder is a very different scenario. So, again, I, you know, I say, what is your system? What is your system on, on your farm? Uh, what resources do you have available to you? Again, I think this graph, I think this graph is critical to 
a lot of the different presentations we're going to be today. And <clears throat> I show this at every grazing school I, I do because, you know, if you're going, if you've got this growth curve of your grass and you're going to have the exact same number of cows every day of the year that they're going to eat, you know, how on earth are you going to make this growth curve work for you? Well, the way we traditionally do it is we bale a lot of hay in the spring and then we feed a lot of hay in the winter. And, and I truly believe in, in that, the most profitable producers I work with are not the ones that do the best job of this, of harvesting as much hay as they can and, and maximizing the number of cows. I think the most profitable producers I work with are the ones that, that if they can run a hundred cows, instead of running a hundred cows, they run 75 cows and they figure out a way to utilize that extra grass with maybe their own calves or even bringing in some other calves from other sources. But they use that backgrounding operation basically as, a, as kind of their drought mitigation plan. You know, it becomes that extra, extra stocking ability to utilize the grass when they have it and take advantage of those low cost gains, but the ability that if they have to, if it turns dry, those calves can go to town and can get out of there. Uh, creating that flexibility, you know, is really, really important. And what do we have in, in Missouri that states around of us are so jealous of us, of us about? The reality is it's fescue. I've been using this slide in the in the grazing schools for years. You know, I used to take a group of beef producers. We'd take a tour uh, four days in the first week of August, and we'd go to as many different operations around Missouri, uh, outside of Missouri as we could. And, you know, when you went out to Kansas, you know, they can put gain on calves like crazy in the Flint Hills in the summer. But there's a reason there's not a lot of cows in the Flint Hills because the winter is really expensive. You get well down into Oklahoma, you know, they've got wheat pasture that's great and some Bermuda, but they don't have much, much for those other time periods of the year. Fescue and the ability to stockpile fescue is really, really our secret weapon to be able to stockpile it in the fall. And I think Eric's gonna talk about some of the gains that you can get on them in the spring that we tend to dismiss. So again, when I look at that value of gain, realize, realize that my value of gain is the highest in the fall and in, in, in winter, but that's when it's the most costly, you know, it's the, the value is, is, is lower in the summer months, but that's when my cost of gain is a lot less. So thinking how I make that work for me is really, really critical. And again, I, I guess I had this slide in here. You know, it does make a difference if I'm looking at that I'm a fall calver and weaning my calves here versus if I'm a spring calver and I'm weaning my spring calves here. I will tell you uh, from all the budgets and everything I've looked at and stuff and, and even my own operation, uh, again, I altered my, <clears throat> I altered when I calved because of this because when it comes to the fall of the year and it's time to wean those springborn calves, You've got to have a cheap forage source to be able to do that, or if you don't, if you're going to have to lock them up in the lot and feed them expensive hay, then your cost of gains can get out of whack really, really quickly. All right. I go back to that quote from Pete Bonds. It's the margin between what cattle cost, what it costs me to put gain on, and what I can sell them for. It isn't rocket science. It's third grade math. So my reasons to background, whether it be my calves or someone else's, comes down to this. Can I do it cheaper than the market? Because I think I've shown markets are efficient. The price slide between one weight category and the next is determined mainly by the cost of gain. Okay. So I have to either be able to do it number one cheaper than the market, or I have to be able to add value to them and capture it. And I'm not going to say that, uh, I don't wean my springborn calves and put them in the dry lot, even when I know my cost is going to be higher, if I can add significant value to them and capture that. So I either have to be able to do it cheaper than the market, or I have to be able to add value to them and capture it, okay? The other reason I think to do it is I think it needs to be incorporated as part of everyone's drought mitigation plan. I think we're really, really bad as cattle producers in Missouri about trying to maximize the number of cows we run on our operation. And I think, I think we all need to think about a few less cows running a slightly slower stocking rate and using the, the stockers, our, our calves, as our, as our drought mitigation plan. 
And then again, I think it's just because it's the right thing to do. I have seen what my calves do whenever I bring them home and, and, and I wean them on the, their home farm where they're used to those things. They just do so much better going forward. So I know that has been a lot of ground I've covered in the last hour, but again, there is my phone number and email address. Uh, feel free to contact me with any questions. Uh, I really wanna applaud everyone for signing up for this course. I think we've got some great presentations <clears throat> lined up for you today, and hopefully this will lead to more programs down the road. Anita, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Wes. Um, again, everybody, there's his uh, email. If you think of some more questions, feel free to send him an email or, or myself. All right, up next, we're going to have uh, our, the health portion of our talk uh, by Dr. Craig Payne. He's an associate extension professor in veterinary medicine. Um, we still got a couple of minutes left and I want to keep us on time in case somebody uh, comes in at that point. So still got time to send in a question via the chat box or my email. Uh, again, that should be uh, down in the corner, snella at missouri.edu. While we're waiting here, Anita, make sure you can hear me and that you can see my slides as well. Yep, looks good, Craig. Okay. All right. Well, uh, Wes, want to thank you again for taking time to start us off. Um, hopefully, he will be able to join us for the Q and A panel. If not, again, you got uh, our contact information if you come up with any marketing or economic questions. Uh, even later on down the road. With that, it is 10 o'clock. Uh, you got your screen pulled up there, Craig. I will hand it off to you. All right, thank you, Anita. Um, real quick, just in case, um, my internet service where I live at, which is north of Columbia, kind of in the Sturgeon area, is a little bit uh, spotty at best. So if I get kicked off, um, it will eventually come back on. I'm logged in on my phone right now. And uh, I sent me to my slide deck just in case things go awry. And, um, she can pull that up and take back over control of the, of the screen share and, and run that um, if by chance to get kicked off. So to start off, let me kind of emphasize something that um, Wesley had said that uh, I don't know if he emphasized it very well, but there's so much diversity in stalker backgrounder systems that it really made it difficult for me to kind of find a medium ground where I could uh, maybe provide some information that would be beneficial uh, to everyone. Um, in my mind, a stalker operation, the way I define it, and, and there, there's various definitions of it, but a stalker operation is a uh, primarily forage-based system where I consider backgrounding system um, a dry lot situation where cattle are, are uh, being delivered to feed. Stalker systems, you know, they can graze cattle for months on end, taking them to a, a, an end point. Uh, backgrounder system, uh, I typically think of those kind of systems as somebody that's uh, taking cattle, getting them straightened out for 45 days and maybe moving on to another stalker operation or putting them out on grass or instead uh, maybe sending them on to a feedlot. Um, so again, with all the diversity that exists in, in this segment of the industry. Um, it's always kind of hard to find a, find a program that, that suits everybody. So with that, here's some of the topics that um, I'm gonna try to cover today. I probably have way more information than I'm gonna be able to get through, that's okay. I think I probably am not gonna be able to get through parasite control, but we can discuss that in the panel discussion uh, this afternoon. So start out with a uh, vaccination program, then I'll delve into the management of BRD or bovine respiratory disease, what most people call pneumonia. That's the most common disease challenge that we're going to experience in these systems. And then of course I'll wind up with parasite control if I have time. So in relation to uh, a vaccine program, um, let me say a couple of things. Uh, first of all, if 
you're working with a local veterinarian and they have you set up on a vaccine program. Regardless of what I say this afternoon or this morning, um, stay with what their recommendations are. And the reason why I say that is that they have a far better understanding of your operation than what I do. And because um, that understanding is sometimes important to tailor make a vaccine program, I would hate you to go in and start changing things around and, and mess things up. Um, the other thing I'll say is in relation to this slide is that I'm not going to talk um, right now about what I typically re recommend vaccinating against. Instead, what this slide is, is covering is, is the most common pathogens that we deal with in these stalker background systems. And all but one of those on this slide are involved in the bovine respiratory disease complex or, or have a role or can have a role in pneumonia. The only one on this slide that doesn't is the clostridials or what most people know as black leg. The other thing that you'll notice on this slide is that um, I've got it broken down into viral and bacterial pathogens. So the viruses that we commonly run into are IVR, uh, BVD, uh, bovine respiratory syncytial virus, which is called BRSV, and then uh, PI3 or perinfluenza 3. Uh, then you've got the bacterials, clostridials, Mannheimia hemolytica, Pasteurella multosta, Histophilus somni, and Mycoplasma bovis. Now, obviously, um, there is a vaccine in the marketplace for every one of these pathogens out there. But here in just a moment, we'll visit a little bit about um, maybe it's not necessary to vaccinate against all these particular pathogens simply because some of the vaccines out there that are manufactured for some of these pathogens, there's very little data to support their efficacy. So here's kind of my common recommendation when um, I'm working with a stock or background or system as to what they should be vaccinating against. So I always recommend vaccinating against all the viruses. Now, when you go to purchase a viral vaccine, you'll sometimes hear the term uh, a five-way viral vaccine. Um, you can see that there's only four viruses on this screen here, but what that is implying is that there's two types of BVD in that vaccine, and that's pretty common at this day and time. The other thing that I always recommend vaccinating against is going to be your clostridial, uh, the black light. Um, you've got to give me a pretty good reason as to why you wouldn't be vaccinating against that. Uh, I've had some producers over time, especially back in the days when I was in private practice, that would stop vaccinating for black leg. Um, they would get along fine for years and then just boom, it would hit them like a freight train and they'd lose several casts of that disease. Uh, that organism can set dormant for years and uh, in the environment. And uh, there's at times when conditions are right that it can come roaring back. That vaccine is, in terms of cost, is pretty cheap. Um, so I just consider it to be cheap insurance. Um, typically, the only other organism or vaccine that I recommend using is, is Mannheimia hemolytica. Um, the reason for that is that that's of, the, of those left that I haven't talked about so far, um, that's the only one out there that has a lot of data behind to support its efficacy. Uh, when you get into Pasteurella mucosida, um, there's, there's a spattering of data. The Stoplosomni vaccine, it, it's kind of ironic in that when, when our diagnostic lab at the university reports results of lung tissue that they've received from across the state uh, from cows that have had pneumonia, one of the most common organisms that they recover from those lungs is the Stoplosomni. Um, however, um, there's a, there's pretty good agreement out there among the veterinary community that although the histophosomni vaccine may prevent systemic disease, um, so there's there's a form of histophilus, um that will exhibit sometimes that causes neurological um, signs. Uh, sometimes it can get to the joints. Those are kind of systemic diseases. While histophilus vaccine will prevent that, um, it doesn't. There's really no data out there to support that it reduces pneumonia associated with that organism. And so 
I guess I always struggle with is, is there a reason to put the additional cost in the animal if the vaccine is not going to give you a return on the investment? Now, mycoplasma bovis, without a doubt, causes problems. Um, we see that quite common in these stalker backgrounder systems. But then again, um, just like Histophilus, that vaccine is, is those that are manufactured, it just doesn't seem to seem to move the bar. So for the very same reason that I often don't re recommend Histophilus, is such a reason I don't recommend mycoplasma bovis either. Just putting additional costs in the animal without potential return. Now, if you're involved in one of those branded vaccine programs, like the Select Vac programs or, or a, a local program that requires things like the Stoffelsomni and, and Mannheimia hemolytica, um, so be it. That's what the program requires. But when you look at programs here in Missouri, like the MFA Health Track program, um, as well as the Missouri Stocker Feeder Quality Assurance Program, which is offered through our local state veterinary association. Uh, several years ago, changes were made to that program where histophilus somni was optional um, for the very reasons that we just described. Uh, timing of those vaccines, um, historically, so if this is a cow-calf operation, uh, historically we've looked at administering them at, you know, uh, two times, once before weaning and again at weaning. But there's some recent data that's come out that has shown that administering these vaccines at uh, 60 to 90 days of age, when most people do um, calf processing, and then again at weaning time, um, is just as efficacious as doing it the old traditional way. So again, it's probably best to work with your local veterinarian um, that has a better understanding of your operation to really get it dialed in as to what you should be vaccinating against in your system. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is the types of vaccines that we have available for use. And I'm not talking about brands in this case. Instead, I'm just talking about killed versus modified live viral vaccines. This is a question that I, I get quite a bit, and so I thought it'd be important for us to talk about it. And uh, I'll set it up this way. Um, talk real general about these vaccines first and then we'll get more detailed as we go along. So kill vaccines, um, they can contain viruses, bacteria, or a combination of the two. Now, from here on out, where you hear me talking about a modified live vaccine or an MLV, I'm referring to viral components of a vaccine only. From the standpoint, there are very few modified live bacterial vaccines in the marketplace, and so, more often than not, when you hear somebody talk about a modified live, they're referring to virus. And so those MLV vaccines, you know, obviously they, they have a modified live virus in them, but they may also have a kill component to it. So if you think about reproductive vaccines that you may use in your cows, um, if you're using something like Bovisil Gold FP5 DL5, um, that's a modified live viral vaccine in combination with Vibrio Lepto, which is, a, which is a kill component. So that's some general differences between the two. How do you tell the difference? Well, if easiest way is to read the label and, and it will explain it to you. Another rule of thumb that you can use is that if you're drawing your vaccine out of one vial, um, then you're using an all kill product. On the other hand, if you're vaccine is coming in a box and you have to mix um, the liquid in with a dried cake in another bottle, um, then you're, you're, something in that vaccine is going to be modified live. All right, so let's talk about some more specific differences between the two. So with kill vaccines, um, they have to put a lot of virus particle in those to stimulate the immune system. And so that's why mod or why kill vaccines are just a little bit more expensive than the MLBs. Again, that virus that is in this vaccine has been inactivated or killed. And if you don't remember anything else I say about the kill vaccines, please remember this. And that is in a naive animal, in an animal that's been previously unvaccinated, it's going to require two doses about 30 days apart in order for you to get the level of protection that you're interested in. Right, so here's the reason why that is. Okay, so 
with your first dose of a kill viral vaccine, essentially what you get is a low level of immunity for a short period of time with the development of what they call memory cells. And those memory cells are exactly what they say they are in that when you come back in and give that second dose of that kill viral vaccine, those memory cells convert over into immune protective cells. And then that gives you this high level of protection for the length of period of time that you're interested in. Okay. So if all you were to do is just give one dose of a kill vaccine and, and an animal that's never been vaccinated before, this is all you're going to get. And this isn't going to protect against much. Okay. Now, with a modified live viral vaccine, here's how they differ. So with a modified live vaccine, in the manufacturing process, what they do is they do passages, what they call passages with this virus. What I mean by that is they grow the virus up in cell culture, they recover it, they grow it up in another cell culture, recover it, and they keep that process up. And each time they do a passage, that virus it reduces its virulence or ability to cause disease in the animal, but it still is alive. And that's an important characteristic of these vaccines. So when you administer that MLB to the animal, you start getting viral replication in cells with that animal. And eventually it builds that antigenic mass that you need to get the immune system off and rolling. Okay, so just like with the kill vaccine, what you get is that priming response, so to speak. Okay, but here's where the difference between the two begin to really show up. And that is with the modified live vaccine, because that virus is still alive, when the immune system begins to kind of tail off right here, that virus begins to, or it's replicating, so the numbers build for that antigenic mass that you need to auto-stimulate that immune system. And so with one dose in an animal that's never been vaccinated before, you can get protection with an MLB vaccine, whereas with a kill viral vaccine, you would only get that priming response, right? And it would require that second dose. All right, so in terms of what vaccines I often recommend, what type of vaccine I recommend in these stalker backgrounding systems, it's, it's nine times out of 10 gonna be a modified live viral vaccine, and probably the percentage is even higher than that. So reasons for that, again, a single dose can be protected. And I understand in some of these systems, one dose is sometimes all people can get into the animal. So if that is the case, that's a, that's a hands down excuse to use a modified live viral vaccine. The other reason why I'm gonna prefer a modified live over a kill is because the immunity that is provided by the MLBs is similar to what would occur with a natural infection. And there's nothing better than being exposed to the wild strain of the virus in order to develop a protective immunity. Okay, so since the MLB stimulate the uh, immune system in a, in a similar way as what the wild type virus would, they're going to give us better protection. Now, one thing that's become common recently is, I'm sure you're all aware, is that um, there's enteral nasal vaccines that have entered into the marketplace. Um, the first one, or at least recently, was um, in force. And, and now there's a, a, another uh, respiratory intranasal vaccine that was released um, this year, and it's nasal gen, and, and it, it's kind of a, a competitor to in force, which has been in use for several years. So the question often comes up, um, it falls under the modified live category. And so you know, what's my preference, intranasal or using an injectable modified live? Well, at this point in time, I, I guess when you look at the data, there's, there's um, the general consensus is, is that protections is kind of equivalent with both. Maybe some of the upsides to the intranasal vaccine is that it does provide, at least from information that I'm aware of, it provides a quicker onset of protection, maybe within 24, 48 hours, whereas with an injectable vaccine, um, you may be looking at somewhere around three to seven days. Um, the downsides to the intranasal um, is that it doesn't have as long a duration of immunity, at least on what I've seen on its approvals when compared to an injectable product. Um, plus, those 
nasal vaccines only contain IBR, BRSV, and PI3. And so in order to get full viral protection, um, you're also going to have to administer an injectable BVD um, to compensate for that virus since it's not in that vaccine. So in my mind, um, I, again, I think it's when you go back to your veterinarian, that's kind of a discussion between you and them as to what the preference would be. Um, I would suggest that if you switch from one to the other and you're having problems, again, visit with your local veterinarian as to why that may be occurring. All right, here's one thing I want to visit about real quickly for the typical cow-calf producer. This is maybe not something they're aware of, um, but for people that do commercial stalker or backgrounding or, or kind of do it for a living, this is something that is has been talked about quite a bit recently. And it, there's been several studies over time. So historically, so if we've got cattle, say we're purchasing from a livestock market, and we're going to either run them as stalkers or backgrounders. Historically, it, it, it's been common for folks to administer modified live viral vaccine on arrival. Um, but there has been some work over time looking at whether delaying that vaccine anywhere from 14 to 30 days post-arrival provides health benefits. Um, where this really was discussed a lot was a couple of years ago. There was a study that was done in a feed yard by uh, a group of feed yard consultants. Um, and what they demonstrated, so they had two groups of cattle. Um, all, both groups on arrival got a, a Mannheim hemolytica vaccine. And then one group got a modified live viral vaccine on arrival, and the other group, they delayed administering that modified live for 30 days. And what they demonstrated is that there was a improvement in health. And I think the main thing that they saw is there was a reduction in second treatment rates for pneumonia by delaying that vaccine by 30 days. Now with that, as, as the world of research goes, for every study out there that shows there's a benefit, there's one out there that shows otherwise. And so I, I think the results are kind of inconclusive, which would make sense. There's so much variability in systems that what may work in one system doesn't necessarily work in another. Um, a classic example of that is in the stalker background or industry, it's been common for people to take a look at what research has been done in feed yards and try to translate that to what they're doing in their system at that stalker background or level. The challenge in doing that is that the disease dynamics in the stalker backgrounder systems are totally different than what they are in a feed yard. And so what works in a feed yard doesn't necessarily apply to those, those stalker backgrounders. Okay, so at the end of the day, where do I kind of settle at on delayed vaccination? Good question. Um, I guess trying to put a rule of thumb together is always a risky because of all the variability. But I guess if I was going to have to um, make a rule of thumb, it would, it would depend on whether animals are acutely or chronic, chronically stressed. And this is kind of based upon some work that has been done over time with acute stress where it's very short term. Um, you know, let's say that a group of calves were taken to a local market. Um, 24 hours later, somebody's bought them. They've got them on their operation. They're looking at processing them. Uh, probably in that case, administering a vaccine at that point in time is, 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 is warranted. On the other hand, if, if it's a situation where, let's say, somebody's purchasing cattle out of southeast U.S. where cattle have been bought from several different barns, co-mingled in a buying station over a several-day um, period of time, or being stuck on a truck, trucked, you know, to, to the Midwest and offloaded. Those cattle have experienced multiple days of stress. And in those situations, the theory is, is that when they're chronically stressed, and you administer that modified live viral vaccine, like I showed you in that previous slide, as it begins to replicate because the immune system is stressed, that virus basically over-replicates, causing those 
unintended health consequences. Okay, so that may be a little bit more information about delayed vaccination than what the typical cow-calf producer that's thinking about doing stalker backgrounding is interested in. Um, but just in case there's somebody on on the webinar that that does this um, as a living and they're buying high-risk stalker calves, um, that, that's kind of the, the details that I know on this subject. Okay, so let's move on and talk about BRD management. Um, again, pneumonia is the most common disease event we're going to run into in soccer backgrounding systems, whether that is you weaning calves on farm and going to take them to the next phase or whether it's somebody that's doing this full time. Um, there's a lot of moving parts to managing BRD. Um, and so to kind of simplify this, I've, I've picked out two concepts that have made the biggest difference in my mind in terms of how I make recommendations for people um, that, that, that are going to do stalker background. Okay, and, and the first concept we're going to visit about, which is ironic considering that we just spent 20 minutes talking about vaccine, is the observations that I've made is that we often, too often, I guess would be better uh, to say we, we too often rely upon the vaccine program alone. And I'll show you here in just a little bit as to why that's a risky proposition. And the other thing that's, that's probably helped me even more than the first one is just understanding how BRD moves through a group of cattle because that has implications on what strategies we can employ to kind of help minimize our risk for those events getting out of control. I'm not going to say that we can always prevent them, but how can we how can we mitigate uh, some of these BRD events? All right, so let's talk about relying upon the vaccine program too much and why that's a risky proposition. First, the first reason for that is that just because we vaccinate an animal does not mean that we get them immunized. You all probably know this and that there are certain circumstances circumstances under which when we vaccinate animals, and I apologize for the misspelling there, it's not nay, it's may, um, but they just may not be capable of responding to the vaccine. Okay, so we've talked about stress already. Um, we know that nutritional deficiencies, protein and energy and trace minerals are important for a properly a functioning immune system, not only to fight off the disease, but also to respond to the vaccine. Um, so if they're nutritionally deficient, we may not get a response. And then if they're harboring subclinical disease, their immune system's already taxed and, and you're just not going to get a response. We've also got this delay of onset of protection in previously unvaccinated animal. And then we've also got situations that have arisen over time where vaccines have been mishandled. Um, maybe they got too cold, maybe they got too hot, and vaccine efficacy is, is impaired because the vaccine basically has been destroyed. So, well, let's say, for instance, everything went right and you got a good immune response to your vaccine, okay? That still does not infer that you're not going to have problems, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So let me explain why that is. So this is a slide that I commonly use when I'm doing um, BQA training. And so if you've seen this before, I apologize, but this is the best way that I can demonstrate how immunity from your vaccine program can be overridden by a significant disease challenge. So what I'm demonstrating here, and, and don't worry about the scale at the bottom, the poor, good, excellent, that's relevant. But what I want you to understand from this slide primarily is that the level of immunity in the herd is a distribution meaning that not every animal in the herd has the same level of immunity for whatever reason. Yes, there is an average, okay? That's why in these distributions, it's highest in the middle because most animals are gonna cluster around that average. But on the other hand, you're gonna have those that are on the bottom end here that for whatever reason, genetics, maybe they just didn't respond to the vaccine as well as they should have. They're going to have low immunity, but you got some on the other end that's got a real good immunity. Okay, so let's say we have a disease challenge level getting to this system. 
All right, under the current circumstances, what we're showing here is that anything to the left of this line doesn't have sufficient immunity to withstand this disease challenge level. Whereas everything to the right of this challenge level line, they're good to go and they'll remain healthy. So what we often do is we come in and we vaccinate our group of animals. And by doing so, if everything's gone right, we can shift the level of immunity of this group of cattle up the scale, so to speak. Okay, so what's the only thing that we have to do in this group of animals to get them sick? Okay, and that is change the challenge level. So we can experience in some of these high throughput, intensely managed stock, stocker backgrounder system, such a high disease challenge level that regardless of how good our vaccine program and how well animals responded to the vaccine, we still run the risk of populations or animals within the population getting sick. And this is a very simplified example, but it kind of gives you the sense of why I'm going to talk about or what I'm gonna talk about next, and that's how do we ma manage this challenge level? Or what are some strategies that we can employ? So I'm gonna show you an example here next in the next slide of how, in my mind, and this is based upon some discussions I've had with stalker veterinarians, especially a good friend of mine that, that lives close to me, or at least here in Missouri, who works with a huge backgrounding operation backgrounding stalker, and, and I've kind of stole his concepts and have put them into the next slide. But but this is this is what or how our stalker veterinarians, as well as feedlot veterinarians, will will vision or view that pneumonia moves through a through a set of cattle. So there's some assumptions that we're going to work in work under uh, in the next slide. And so the first one is the disease that we're or this pneumonia we're going to be talking about has a incubation period of five days. So we're going to say this is going to be due to a viral insult. And by incubation period, what I mean by that is that under these COVID days, this is probably going to be, uh, this is probably going to resonate with you all even better. But incubation period is that time from when the animal is infected till the time it starts showing clinical signs where we can recognize that that animal is coming down with pneumonia. Uh, we're also going to work under the assumption that the shedding of the virus after the animal starts on day five. Okay, so um, it, it starts at, at, at the day they start showing clinical signs. And then it's going to end on day 15 after that initial infection. So it's going to, that shedding is going to end 10 days after you see clinical signs. We're also going to work under the assumption that this is transmitted through nose to nose contact and it can be aerosolized. And so transmitted that way. And the final term you may have not heard before, it's called the disease reproductive rate. I'm gonna say that's four. And essentially what I mean by the reproductive rate of a disease is that for every animal that is infected, it's going to expose and infect four other animals, which is going to result in disease in those four other animals. Okay. So here's the concept that I stole from the veterinarian that I mentioned. So here's a pen of cattle or, or a group of cattle. Here's day zero, and we're gonna say that our index case is this star right here in the middle. Okay, so it's day zero, that animal is infected, maybe it came into the system um, from the livestock market, let's use that as an example, it's infected. Okay, so we've got a five day incubation period, so on day five, that animal's gonna start shedding. Okay, so we've got a reproductive rate of four. So what that means is that by day 10, if that animal exposes other animals in that pen, and it starts shedding, obviously. So that means by day 10, what we're gonna have is four other animals infected in this pen. Now, each one of those four is gonna affect another four. So now we're kind of getting into exponential growth, right? And so by day 15, this is the pathogen load existing in this pen, right? Now, obviously, the first calf, our index case, it quit shedding. And now we've got all these other calves in the pen that are still shedding. We've got these two stars yet here to be infected. Imagine what this would look like if it was a pen of 100, right? So on day 20, 
these last two are going to be infected, right? Those second group of four that were um, showing clinical on day 10, now they've quit shedding, so on and so forth. Okay, so here's what it looks like on day 30. And we go back to a disease-free pen. Okay, one other thing I gotta mention about that is that we worked under the assumption that every animal in this pen was gonna be susceptible to disease. We didn't include the fact that they may have been vaccinated, right? But all that to say is what I showed you here, does that, is that what we see in the real world? Well, here's what we call a cumulative morbidity curve, which is basically just adding on every day the number of animals that experience BRD. So we're accumulating them over time. And this is some data that I just pulled from a vaccine trial that we did out one of our university farms years ago to show you that you see this quick slope coming up here and it starts to flatten out around day 20. Now there's still a little bit of growth here, but it eventually lays out. So I guess the end of the story is that yeah, it, it, it's more complicated than what I showed you in the previous series of, of, of events, but that's how BRD moves through a pen of animals. Okay, so what's the implications of this for strategies that we can use? Well, although vaccines are not foolproof, if, if we can get some of the animals protected in the pen, that helps reduce the number of animals that are going to be susceptible as well as it does reduce reduce pathogen load, okay? The other thing that this emphasizes is how important early disease detection is. One challenge that I have seen for cow-calf producers that try to do stalker backgrounding is they're not all that familiar with detecting signs, early signs of respiratory disease. And so by the time they recognize it, it's already been smoldering, okay? And so by the time they recognize it, they're already behind the eight ball. And so I, I, I think that is something that if you're going to entertain the idea of, of, of doing stalker or backgrounding and, and cow-calf is all you've ever done before, you may need to work with somebody to, to get dialed in and getting those animals pulled quickly and treated quickly as well. Um, I won't get into antibiotics this morning. Um, that's kind of a hornet's nest anyhow, what a, what a treatment plan may look like. Uh, again, like the vaccine program, that's something that's better discussed between a local veterinarian and you. Um, but regardless of what your sequence of treatments are and what antibiotics that you use in those treatments, it, 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 it's imperative that you detect those animals in the dirt early in the disease process and get them treated because we have seen time and time again that's one of the key factors as to whether animals are going to respond to your treatment or not. The antibiotic can only do so much. Okay, and if that animal has been dealing with BRD uh, for several days uh, before you detect it and you only detect it once it's just gotten, you know, uh, at an end stage, you're not going to have any success or your success is going to be minimal in getting that animal to respond. Okay, we, we also know that in some of these systems, they do what they call metaphylaxis, and that is they administer an antibiotic on arrival along with their vaccines, and the reason for that is just to help reduce bacterial colonization and maybe give those cattle a little bit of a head start. Okay, the, the final one here to me is, is probably just as important as any other. Um, that I've described, and that is what they call pathomitigation. That's a term that uh, two stalker veterinarians recently came up with, and, and basically that's how do we alter timing and degree of exposure to potential BRD pathogens. So, so a couple of concepts to keep in mind is that last thing you want to do, so this is day 15, right, um, over here on the right side. So the last thing that you want to do in, in this situation is either dump some fresh cattle in this pen or put them in fence line contact with this pen because this, this cloud of whatever this is does not recognize pen boundaries. 
or, or pasture boundaries, right? So if you put new arrivals who are stressed, vaccine hasn't time, had time to take yet, so to speak, and you put them up against this or in this, you're going to have a train wreck. Um, and, and, and the more pins that you've got existing in this backgrounding system that look like this, the bigger issues you're going to have. So that kind of takes me to the, the other scenario here, and that's just minimize commingling as much as you can. Um, sometimes it's not possible. Um, and even at the cow-calf level, folks, Wesley had talked about bringing calves from other pastures, um, and those calves haven't been exposed to each other, haven't been exposed to their path pathogens and, and dumped all in the same pen. I've seen BRD events explode because of that. Which is ironic, right? Because you, you would think that, well, they're, they're, they've been raised under your care. How much difference is there among groups of cattle from different pastures? Um, I've seen people that don't wean all at the same time instead have to do it over a period of time. Um, in Wesley's situation where he gathers them all up, puts them on a pen in one day, that's, that's probably the best strategy. Where I've seen people get themselves in a pickle as they wean a group of calves, Two weeks later, they wean another group of calves and they put them in with that group that was first weaned and that second group of calves just falls apart because of the exposure level that they get. And then the final one that is another strategy that some will employ in the fall of the year when BRD really seems to blow up is just re reducing animal concentration per pen. And, and the concept behind that is that if you think about this pen, what it would look like if we had a hundred head in here, the more animals that you have in the pen, I guess the best way to describe it is the more fuel, the more logs that you can throw on the fire to fuel that fire. Okay, so by reducing number of animals per pen, you can maybe help uh, minimize some of that pathogen load just by doing that, all right? Okay, so I've got about five minutes less be left based upon my time. And so I do have time to go over parasite control. This may be a little bit different than what you expected me to talk about. I'm gonna focus on this concept of parasite resistance, which is something that has really been coming to the forefront in the last couple of years. It seems like every veterinary conference that I go to, when you have a parasitologist on the program, they are talking about parasite resistance. Now we've known it's been in the sheep and goat industry here in the U.S. for some time now. Um, here in the here in the U.S. now resistance has been in cattle, in particular, has been reported worldwide for years. Here in the U.S., the the first time that we had documentation of it was in 2004, and this was in a stalker operation. I think it was kind of in Wisconsin vicinity. Um, it was a USDA researcher, a parasitologist that was doing this study, but he documented caparia resistance and homonchus resistance, which those are two different parasites. We've known caparia has been resistant or somewhat tolerant to our common dewormers that we've been using. We, we've known that for some time now. Uh, homonchus, on the other hand, was kind of a new finding in this situation. Um, really wasn't a lot of concern in 2004 because as the slide says, Caparius typically has low pathogenicity, but it can affect weight gains, and homonchus isn't very prevalent, especially when you get into the northern states. But the, the game changer here is they're starting to uh, they're starting to recognize ostertasia resistance or the brown stomach worm. And for those of you on the uh, conference that's been around as long as I have, you may be Remember back into the days when we only had products like the, the drenched dewormers and Levamisol, where we would see full blown ostertasia parasite um, signs in, in cattle. They get rough hair coats, they get diarrhea, they get bottle jaw, so on and so forth. Um, resistance really is, is a minimal concern, but now they're starting to document this ostertasia resistance, which I've already said is a game changer because of the potential ramifications of that. Okay, so one thing I need you to understand is that resistance to one drug within a class, so if a parasite is resistant to one drug within a class, switching to 
this, uh, another drug within that same class, those parasites are going to still be resistant to it. And keep in mind, a lot of our deworming products out there have been in the market. Well, the last new release of a compound, I believe, was in, in, in the, you know, it, it's been 20 years now, probably. And I know long range is a new product. But at the end of the day, it's still a crinomectin, which is no different than what's in Epernac. So my point is, and just switching from Dectamax to Cydectin does not necessarily mean if you got parasite resistance that that's going to solve the problem. Now, determining whether you got parasite resistance is a whole different presentation. But with that, get to my point because I'm going to run out of time here, and that is. What you hear a lot of people talking about at this day and time is, is deworming with combination. Okay, so, so the most common example I can give you is not only using an injectable like Dectamax or Cydectin, but also coupling that up with a white drenched dewormer like Synanthic or Valvacin or whatever the case may be. And in that situation, you get a broader spectrum of activity. Okay, and then last but not least is maintaining some level of refugia. I think I just got a note, it's time to shut down. Um, and we can talk more about that in the discussion session if you would like. All right, so I'll, I'll end there and Anita, turn it back over to you. Thanks, Craig. Uh, you still got a minute left. Um, I have not received any questions yet or any in the chat box. Any other final things you'd like to add? Nothing on my end, I mean. All right, then. Um, so we got less than a minute left. I'll go ahead and uh, let Dr. Eric Bailey, go ahead and get set up. Uh, he will be our next speaker for the first part of uh, the nutrition talk. Um, we, we're going to have two parts because that's how important nutrition is. Uh, there's a lot to cover. So next up, we have Dr. Eric Bailey. He's our one of our state beef uh, specialists on campus. Uh, he specializes in beef nutrition. So with that, Eric, I'll let you go ahead be able to share your screen. All right, take it away. All right, Anita, how's the sound? Sounds good on my end. Okay, mm -hmm. perfect. Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you for spending your beautiful Saturday morning with us here talking about uh, backgrounding and stalkers and preconditioning. Um, so my focus today, what I'm, I'm going to hammer on is the uh, our feeding programs for for these these growing calf systems, and really kind of sprinkle in some of the, uh, the management and some of my experience with these. So I I have uh, have a lot of background in in putting these feeding programs for for growing calves together um, in multiple states. This is something that I, I'm I'm pretty comfortable with. Something that I feel is you know really sorely needed in Missouri because we have just such a tremendous forage resource here in this state with uh, with with tall fescue and, and there's there's a lot of opportunity I think for cow calf producers to really benefit from incorporating you know some kind of a, a growing calf system. So just for reminder's sake I'm gonna I'm gonna go through the terminology again just so that everybody's clear I might I might kind of jump and forth back and forth around a little bit. But certainly we're going to have folks who might fall into each of these three terms. So for me, preconditioning is when you retain your calves, you know, post weaning on the farm or ranch of origin. And you, your hope is to put some weight on these calves to get some value, additional value out of these calves post weaning. Backgrounders are buying somebody else's calves and adding value, um, typically in a, in a dry lot type setting. Um, is the mic a little low? Sorry, I can... I've got my wireless headset on, but uh, if the sound is bad, okay, we'll see what I can do. Ronnie, thanks for that uh, for that comment. Um, let's see. Okay, 
So backgrounding is, is buying someone else calves with the intention of adding value. And, and the way I look at backgrounding is the way that Craig and Wesley do, where it's typically, I'm gonna be putting feed, I'm gonna be feeding these animals every bite they get in a dry lot type setting. Whereas, you know, stocker systems or someone else's calves, buying them with the intention or even taking them on, on the game with the intention of adding value. But the difference between stocker and backgrounding is that it's a grazing system, okay? so. The goals of each of these systems are to add value through uh, to to these animals, and you know, preconditioning the value that you add might be a little bit different in that it is either a, a branded, you know, value added program, back forty five, select forty five, something along those lines, or you know, simply the additional pounds of weight gain that you get um, from putting these calves through this system. Backgrounding and stockers is a fundamentally different business model than. Um, you know, cow calf for preconditioning in that, you know, what you're in a lot of respects, the most successful backgrounders and stocker operators are, are upgrading undervalued cattle, you know, putting uh, small lots of cattle together in larger groups of like, you know, sex, size, color, etc. Um, you know, taking cattle that have been mismanaged and upgrading them through, um, you know, feeding health and, and just management programs. But Really, to me, the fundamental difference in the, in the backgrounding and stocker programs relative to any other segment of the cow-calf or any other segment of the industry that's, that's important is that a lot of your profit on the, on the backgrounding and stocker side is largely baked in when you get the cattle bought, okay? And so, you know, if you make a bad buy on a good group of cattle, you know, it's going to be tough to make a profit even if they gain well, even if they... Um, even if they're healthy. Whereas in other situations, if, if you can buy cattle, you know, I'm, I'm just throwing a number out there. If you can buy cattle $20 a hundred weight under the market, you know, you could, you can absorb a couple of percent death loss and, you know, maybe some, you know, kind of mediocre performance and, and still be profitable. Now, at the same time, you also expose yourself to market risk in that, you know, if the market turns and you're holding these animals, certainly there's, there's potential for them, you know, to, to, um, be worth less per pound at, at the end of the deal, even if you've done everything right. So um, preconditioning programs, just kind of a brief um, introduction on them before we get into the, the nutrition programs. You know, typically the branded preconditioning programs, we're talking, you know, 30 to 60 days from, from maternal separation or, you know, fancy term for, for weaning. Uh, they're going to incorporate a vaccination program. Um, while it's probably not required, it's implied that these animals are gonna have some sort of a nutritional education, you know, being understanding what a, what a waterer and a feed bunk is basically. Uh, castration, dehorning, deworming, you know, all of these practices kind of bundled into one for, with a goal of reducing uh, morbidity and mortality uh, among that group of calves, okay? Now, I have a little bit different look on preconditioning than what a lot of people might talk about. And, and really my, my look on outlook on preconditioning comes from some work that Mark Hilton did when he was at Purdue. Okay, and so what he did was he was a, a, an extension veterinarian and he had fought, kept records on one single farm over 11 years that preconditioned calves every year. Okay? On this farm, over the 11 years, they made about $70 a head in profit per year, 68.95 as you can see on the screen. And the, the least they ever made in any one of those 11 years was $26 a head. However, what was really interesting about that, that operation and the, over those 11 years is that the preconditioning premium, so the, what they, they garnered at the sale barn uh, or at auction, fluctuated by, you know, tremendously. As you can see, the premium, there was one year where they were actually docked or, you know, discounted by $3.51 a hundredweight relative to non-preconditioned calves. And, and the, the reason for that escapes me, but I, I, if I was to hypothesize, it was probably a fleshy discount you know, to another year where those animals were worth $11 a hundredweight more. But the big takeaway from, from Hilton's, Hilton's work and what I think is really important for everybody to understand here and is that in his summary of the data, 63% of the profit that those animals made was due to putting weight on those calves. It wasn't simply from, you know, taking or from garnering a premium um, in a value-added calf sale. Um, 
you know, and so, so a preconditioning program that, that's, that is on a lower plane of nutrition where cattle gain is, is less, you know, you're, you're going to leave some dollars on the table. And I actually, I, I took a direct quote out of his publication. It's available at the website there. Um, you get, he said, you get paid for gain. Calves only gaining a pound and a half a day use most of the nutrients consumed to, for maintenance. Develop a ration where two and a half average pounds of average daily gain is possible. And I, I really firmly believe that myself, just based on my own personal experience in this avenue. Now, certainly there are times where we, you know, we might quote unquote warehouse cattle calves, you know, um, that might be, might get them bought cheap. Um, and hold them over the winter and hope to sell them in the spring for, for more per hundred weight. You know, there, 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 there's fluctuation in the seasonality in the prices and that, that warehousing does happen a lot in the industry. But if, if you're trying to put, trying to make money on a preconditioning deal, if you're a cow-calf producer and trying to think of whether that's going to fit in for you or not, you know, you really need to, these calves need to gain. They need to be on a positive plane of nutrition. And you know you probably need to be a little more aggressive than what what you think. I run into a lot of folks here in the state of Missouri that are very content with a pound and a half of average daily gain, and I'm I'm trying to over time sort of you know educate or talk people into hey you know certainly we can get the calves too fleshy if we push them too hard, but you know we have as an industry have made dramatic improvements to the genetics of the cow herd across the state and across this country in the last couple of decades and you know um a, a two pound average daily gain today is not going to lock you into a fleshy discount at the sale barn you know uh, in fact two is a two is a pretty safe number at this point two and a half in my in my own opinion is a pretty safe number you know it's when you get above three pounds a day that's where you I, based on my experience when you're looking at modern genetics where you start to maybe see some flesh or some bloom on those calves come in and you know you might begin to see some of those fleshy discounts okay so um looks like i got a chat in the question uh getting a little quiet sorry about that i don't know what's going on i'm sitting still here at my uh my laptop um uh, i'll let me see what if there's anything i can do i apologize for this y'all let's go Quick, this video settings. Okay, I just turned my mic up just a tick. So if it if it's too loud, if I'm if it sounds like I'm shouting in your ear, I apologize. I'll I'll adjust it back. Okay, so let's see. All right, sounds good. Thanks. Uh, apologize for the for the delay there, folks. So let's talk about what it's going to take to get these calves to to gain, you know, two two and a half pounds a day. Now, I don't intend for this to turn into an academic talk, um, you know, and that you can see I've got TDN and NEG and ADG on the uh, on the screen here. Now, this is just a this is a table out of the most recent um, nutrient requirements for beef cattle textbook, and the the point I'm trying to make here is that you know we're not going to get the performance that we hope for out of these calves without putting some groceries into these calves okay and so the example here we've got is a 550 pound calf and you'll notice we've got four different diet examples a b c d we've got the total digestible nutrients which is a measurement of energy we've got the net energy for gain concentration in the feed which is expressed there in the middle column and then the expected average daily gain in the far right column now the expected average daily gains that you see is a function of environment management and size and you know really you should consider these to be the gain that would be possible under ideal conditions okay the point that i want to make here if for those of y'all that are cow calf producers who might be testing hay right now and looking at you know kind of accustomed to looking at feeds that might range anywhere from 45 maybe 48 tdn to high 50s maybe occasionally crossing the 60 tdn threshold we're talking about a different plane of nutrition to get these calves to perform to to our expectations from what i see you know having been the state extension beef nutrition specialist for three years here in missouri is that you know in in on our operations across the state you know energy seems to be the nutrient that that we're most often limiting in in beef cattle diets 
And so, you know, I'm, you're going to hear me talk a lot more about energy than you are any of the other nutrients throughout the course of these two talks, just for that reason. If you think about it, you know, you look and you look at these examples here, if you've got a hay that is, let's say, 50 TDN, 50% 50 TDN, you know, and that's what you're expecting to feed your calves and get them to gain two pounds a day. Well, you know, there are certain situations where that certainly could be a possibility that it would happen. That's not going to be something that you would expect year in year over year basically and so you know what i'm trying to 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 make the point of and to really drive home is that we're we're operating on a different plane of nutrition when we're trying to get these calves to grow you know we're we're looking at how are we going to get you know a 70 to 75 tdn diet or a 49 to 55 um mega calorie per pound neg concentration net energy per gain how are we going to get that in front of these animals to give them the opportunity to grow at the rate that we're, we're hoping for. And we'll go through that. It, this is just more for a sort of a reframing our perspective. Okay. So one of the things that we have to think about when we do this is that, you know, we understand that a calf as a percent of their body weight is going to eat more feed than, than, than a cow will in most cases. And so what I put here is this is, this table is actually out of that same uh, beef cattle nutrient requirements textbook. Um, and it's got different weight classes. And this is the expected feed intake, assuming that they have unrestricted access to feed. So this is what we would expect them to eat, basically. And you'll notice that the expectation for dry matter intake or for feed intake is, you know, as a percent of body weight is in the far right column, you know, we're typically going to be around two and a half percent of body weight. And it's not that uncommon to see some of those lighter cattle as well. You know, I, I like to tell people if they're under, if they're under 600 pounds, they're probably going to eat 2.8 to maybe even 3% of their body weight, you know, if, if you let them have unrestricted access. The point being is that, you know, we have to feed them uh, a little bit and we have to, we have to be aware of how we're going to get them to, to eat that amount of feed on top of having the right nutrient concentrations to get that expected performance, okay? And so what I like to tell people is that if you're working with somebody or you're trying to plan this out, you know, I haven't talked about protein, but you know, protein really isn't the limiting factor in, in a lot of these cases on a lot of our farms across the state. You know, make sure you got a diet that's 12 and a half percent crude protein. It's 0.5 megacals per pound of NEG and you know feed them two and a half percent of their body weight a day if you think about energy in terms of tdns of neg we're looking at a 70 tdn diet. so that's those are those are kind of the general recommendations and we'll start to kind of break these apart and look at different scenarios over the upcoming slides here okay now for the you know average producer who is you know thinking about dipping their toes in the water and, and even some that currently are doing this in this state, this is a pretty common um, system that I see set up. And, you know, a producer is essentially thinking or, or planning a system where they're going to let these calves have unrestricted access to hay, and then they're going to feed them some supplement. Um, and, and in a sense, let the calves manage their, their forage intake and then provide them a small amount of, of grain or of concentrate to essentially, um, you know, balance that, that ration out. And from my perspective, by ration, I mean the hay plus the supplement or the total amount of feed that the animal is consuming. Okay. So, you know, the, the biggest mindset shift that we're going to have to undergo if we're going to do a supplement for free plus free choice hay here is that the quality of the hay is going to be a significant factor in the success of this operation in terms of getting animal performance to meet expectations. The reason for that is that, you know, poor hay, poor quality hay doesn't have a lot of nutrient or nutritive value to it. And so what happens is you'll see if you're letting the calf eat as much hay as you want and you're feeding them a couple pounds of supplement a day, the hay quality is going to be the largest determinant of performance there. Yeah, sure, we might increase the, the, the overall quality of the diet a little bit, but you know, my, my biggest recommendation for anybody who's thinking about doing this is that if you're going to do it, I, I would strongly encourage you to think about, you know, how can I get as good a hay as possible in front of these cattle? And if so, you know, do I, do I make good enough hay to feed these cattle? 
or am I making or buying what would I would consider cow hay? You know, cow hay is going to be something that is high 40s to low 50s TDN on an energy perspective, and it's going to be somewhere between 8 and 12, 8 and 10 percent crude protein. You know, we really would like the, the hay to be, you know, high 50s TDN, low 60s, and, and you know, be, you know, at over 10 percent crude protein, something that we, we can then essentially balance the ration with, with a small amount of supplement and get them up to that threshold where they will gain, you know, over a couple pounds a day. You know, a, a big determinant of, of supplement intake is that, you know, we want to make sure if we're hand feeding these calves every day, we want to make sure that they're, all cattle have the ability to eat supplement. Um, you know, make sure that they have 18 inches of, of linear bunk space per head so that all the calves can get up there and eat at once because if you're only feeding them a couple pounds of supplement a day, you know, it's not going to last in the bunk 30 minutes. And so, you know, any stragglers are slow to come to the bunk, they're not going to have the chance to eat. And that's going to create some variation in, in performance among the calves in the group. Um, you know, and, and the reason to go back to the feed good hay to growing cattle, one of the things that I, I really kind of go back to is that as I talk to people who are exploring preconditioning or backgrounding, or doing it in this state, but wanting to dip their toes in the water, they may not have access to the equipment or facilities to um, mix a TMR, to um, even you know feed significant quantities of feed. I know Wesley's not here to defend himself, but I regularly give Wesley a hard time for you know in his backgrounding or I'm sorry his preconditioning operation at home. You know, he's feeding calves out of a five gallon bucket. And so the amount of feed that I prescribe for him to put out to his calves every day is, is constrained by that sort of labor system. And, you know, I, I, I don't criticize him for, for doing that. I, I understand, you know, that's, that's, a, that's just a reality of the way a lot of people are going to do it here. But that, that really limits the amount of feed that you can put out. And really, to me, magnifies the need to have good hay so that you don't have to put very much supplement out because if you have bad hay you can make bad hay work in a diet to get in a diet like this to get calves to perform but you're going to have to feed more than than in other ways and so you know if you only have the ability to feed three or five pounds of, of grain a day to these calves you know you're going to need good hay now, you know, I, I don't want to bleed too much of my own personal opinion into, into any scenario or system, but this is just not my, my favorite option for feeding calves because really, you know, um, unless somebody's pretty diligent about, about testing their hay, you know, if, if, you're, if you're diligent about making good hay, if you're using your own hay at home, or even just testing the hay and knowing what's in it, you know, that's going to be the biggest question mark or unknown in this entire system. And if the hay is poorer than you expect, one of the things that you're going to see is relatively poor feed conversions. You're going to see performance that, you know, might be good. Some, some years might be bad other years. It, it, you're really, you're really relying on that hay quality to, to um, get your cattle to perform. And, and, you know, in this case, going back to that picture, you know, if you're putting out free choice hay and, you know, your expectation is that you're only going to put out hay once a week and you've got this type of a hay feeding system, you'll notice from the picture, you know, those heifers right there, there's about a half dozen six weight, you know, re replacement heifer prospects in this, in this example. You know, they wasted a heck of a lot of that bale, as, as you can see. And so the trade-off that you're making there is you know the convenience of only feeding once a week versus you know the the efficiency of the the usage of that 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 feed resource itself okay and so that's where i say on this slide here at the bottom that feed conversion can be poor waste can be substantial okay now gene schmitz who is a, a livestock specialist uh, with mu extension over in the sedalia area he is very diligent about testing um, hay for his, his, uh, his producers every year. And he, he does a really nice job of compiling these data, these results from these hay analyses as they come into his office into a spreadsheet. And he, he regularly shares that with me and with, it, with our colleagues throughout MU Extension. And I wanna show you, um, these are his results of fescue hay analyses from 2019. 
Now, I'll be really honest with y'all. He had a heck of a lot more than five of examples of fescue hay, but what I tried to do was I tried to pull five that were kind of in the middle, not, not the best quality, not the worst quality, but five that were relatively representative examples from kind of the middle. Now, I report on this table here, um, ADF, which stands for acid detergent fiber. That's an analysis that gets done at the laboratory, an actual analysis that we then use to predict the TDN and the NEG, or those two different measurements of energy. Um, as you can see here, all five examples of this fescue hay, it ranged from about 48% TDN at the bottom up to 52% TDN at the top. But look at that NEG. So 0 0.16, 0 0.1, or 0 0.23, 0 0.12, 0 0.24, 0 0.22. Remember, our target is 0 0.50 in terms of NEG, and in terms of TDN, it's 70. Okay, and so this fescue hay, this kind of common fescue hay, we've got a long way to go in terms of, of getting the average up to 70, and it's going to take substantial, you know, feed supplement inputs to, to, to make that happen. And so, you know, I, I'm just trying to point out, and it, it sounds kind of callous to say, but, you know, fescue hay is probably quality-wise, unless you're making a significant effort to, to, to make quality hay, it's probably not as good as you think it is. Now, I'm, I'm a visual learner myself, and what I wanted to do was I wanted to show you all um, this, but in a, in a visual format. And so I put it in a graph here where we look at a TDN um, content and our, our target. And so I've got 65 TDN and two pound average daily gain. So that, that dotted line represents what the TDN requirements need to be in the diet for these calves to gain. Now, I actually stole these slides out of a different presentation for stockpiling fescue. So that's why I've got October, November, December, January, February, and March along the bottom there. But for this example, I just want to show you what it looks like graphically. You know, if you've got low 50s TDN and you need high 60s TDN to, to get animals to perform, okay? You, that gap between the, the dotted green line and that sort of burnt orange uh, solid line, that's the gap that you're gonna have to fill with supplement if you're, if you're gonna rely on fescue hay in, in this example, you know, for, for growing calves. Okay, so supplement options. Now, the supplement options, you know, a, a supplement that I like a lot is a 50-50 mix of cracked corn and dried distiller strains. The reason that I like it is it's nearly 20% protein and it's 0.7 megacalories per pound of NEG. So it, it, is a, um, it is a high quality feed, an extremely high quality feed. And you'll notice, you know, 0.70, that's our target is 0.5 in this case. So it's well above the, um, well above their, their threshold to get these cattle to gain. So you can upgrade lower quality forages with it. I like the 50-50 mix because, you know, corn has a significant component or quantity of starch in it. And so I'm diluting some of the starch out by, by using dry distillers grains. Remember, we use the starch in corn to make ethanol. And so the leftovers, uh, the, the non-starch components of the corn is what's used to, what is, what comprises distillers grains after the, the process. Now the challenge is right now with all the, the, turmoil in the cattle and the, the grain markets and COVID-19 and everything that's going on is that we've seen um, distillers grains become a little bit difficult to source in the marketplace. And when we can source them, the price is, is, is high right now. So we'll get more a little more into my sort of cowboy math in terms of economics in a minute. This one might not be a possibility at this stage in the game for you, but it is a, a very simple mix and, and it, it's a concentrated mix and it's a high protein mix that you know could be used as kind of an all-in-one stock feed if, if somebody was looking for something to something to use across you know multiple uh, production systems on the farm. Okay so what I've got on the slide here the table below that are really what I, I consider to be six common feeds that I see across the state of Missouri. Now you'll notice that these are individual commodities um, I, I, in general, like to look at commodity feeds because, you know, oftentimes the, the price of them is quite competitive, okay? And so what I want to point out to you, though, is that they vary quite a bit in both their protein and energy content, okay? 
so corn is king in terms of energy content. It, 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 it just is. Now, the significant downside to corn is that you'll notice in terms of crude protein, you know, it's not a significant source of crude protein. And so it has to be mixed with something else to use it. Now, when we're talking about $3.50 a bushel corn, there, there's a pretty significant um, financial motivation to, um, to feed this corn and to use that as an energy source. And the question then becomes, what can I find to mix with it as, to provide that additional protein to, to get the protein to where we, where we need it to be? Distiller's grains, you'll notice, has nearly similar energy to corn, but it has 30% protein. That's why the two really worked well together. And, you know, for, for you know, a couple of decades now, you know, distiller's grains has been a, a real game changer in terms of how nutrition, beef cattle nutrition works. Now, some other really common options, you know, soy hulls, uh, gluten pellets, wheat middlings, hominy, you know, these feeds here, I, I, I list all four of them and, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit each about them. Um, I really like them, but understand that I like them and, and really any of these corn and distiller's grains as well. My like for them is based on the price that I can get them. My like for them is not based on how well I've gotten along with them in the past or how um, any other sort of external factor. I, I, I'm, I'm, I am bottom line driven when it comes to providing nutritional supplements, especially in a growing cap system. They all fluctuate in price throughout the course of a year. And, you know, um, one thing that I'm seeing in the markets right now is soy holes seem to be higher than, than they have been at this time of year in previous years here in Missouri. And, you know, I, I don't have a solid explanation as to why, but it really kind of leans me to shy a little bit away from, you know, overpaying for soy holes. I like soy holes a lot at $110, $120 a ton. I don't like them. I, I don't like them very much at $160, $170 a ton, just to give you some, some frame of reference. Um, you know, gluten pellets, gluten pellets are kind of a, what I like to call distiller's light in a sense. Significant energy, significant protein. Um, you know, the, the pr problem with gluten pellets is, you know, they're typically going to be 180 to 200 a ton in, in normal circumstances. Wheat middlings, uh, wheat middlings are a, a, a commodity feed that we don't, I don't think enough people know about or think about. We can see significant fluctuations in price of wheat middlings throughout the course of the year. And in fact, now, um, you know, this time of year, you know, it, it's not that uncommon to see wheat mids sell for, you know, quite frankly, just a little over $100 a ton. And, you know, if you compare that in terms of energy and protein content, you can get a pretty screaming buy on these nutrients using wheat mids relative to some of the other competitors out there. Hominy, hominy is something that's kind of available sort of in specific locations. You know, um, it, it, it's in a sense, the way I like to think about it, it it's kind of corn light. The problem with hominy is that you can see a little bit more variation in the composition of it. And so, you know, I'm looking at it. If I, if I have hominy and corn at the same price, I'm going to buy corn 12 times out of 10. If I can buy hominy for a 30% discount relative to the price of corn, I'm probably going to go the, I'm going to go the hominy route. And, you know, those, those two are going to be interrelated to one another um, quite a bit. So now commodity blends versus complete feeds. This is a question that comes up and I, it's kind of a controversial question because, you know, um, I, I, I don't want us to bias you in one direction or, or the other. I just want to point out to you all that, you know, in terms of using individual commodities or making a blend of commodities at the feed mill or even mixing them on your farm, you know, the cost and overhead are going to be the two largest differences between the two. Um, you're going to need equipment to store multiple commodities, to mix commodities, to feed commodities. And that's often the value proposition that um, the feed companies make to use a branded complete feed product. For a smaller producer, you know, being able to pay or paying that premium for convenience, the convenience of not having to have equipment to store multiple feeds, to have the equipment to mix the feeds, you know, that, that's a pretty decent value proposition. You know, the way you value convenience on a small scale is different than if I'm trying to feed a family based on a backgrounding, preconditioning operation, something along those lines. Um, I will say that, and in, in you're, you're, you're going to hear this 
common thread throughout my presentations. You know, really a scenario that I'm not a big fan of, even though it's probably the most convenient is you know, most convenient scenario is to put a complete feed in a self feeder and let calves, you know, essentially manage their own bunks. Um, in that case, you're you're really paying a lot for convenience in most examples. And I'll run through this quick example with you. You know, feed efficiency becomes a huge deal if you're if you're looking to save on labor and go the self fed route. Um, in general, and this is just a principle, there's there's not there there's a lot of data about it, but I don't have any data in here. You know, the more control that you have over feed intake uh, um, of beef calves, the more efficient they're going to be. Um, and you know, I'll give you a a really simple example. So if you're buying a feed that's four hundred dollars a ton, um, or you know twenty dollars a hundred weight, and your calves are only take five pounds of that feed per pound of weight gain. So, you know, actual pounds of beef that you're putting on or pounds of weight live calf. You know, even a scenario like that is still gonna cost you a dollar per pound of gain. And so does your value of gain match up with a situation um, like that that would allow you to be profitable? Because Wesley did an excellent job of, of identifying that just because a calf sells for $2 a pound does not mean that the value of taking that putting 50 pounds on that calf is going to be, or 100 pounds on that calf or whatever, is going to be worth that $2 a pound. Five pounds of feed per pound of gain is, a, is an efficient animal in the beef industry. It's not that uncommon to see calves be, you know, well-managed calves be five to six pounds of, of, per pound of gain. But, you know, for, for some poorly managed situations and scenarios, you know, for that feed to gain to be like eight pounds of feed per pound of gain. And in a situation or scenario like that, you know, we're talking about, we're talking about a lot more expensive of a deal. So now to get into the feeding and bunk management aspect or component of this, um, for me, you know, if I'm trying to get these cattle to eat, now I'm kind of transitioning over to a more, less of a I'm going to feed them some good hay and a couple of pounds of supplement to uh, I'm going to either feed them a significant amount of, of a commodity, a grain or concentrate or plus, you know, free choice access to hay or I'm going to feed them a TMR. If you're feeding them a TMR, uh, you know, you've got to you've got to start thinking about, you know, I, I like to encourage people to think about intake as a percent of body weight rather than a number of pounds because when you tie intake to a percent of the animal's body weight you scale that intake as they grow okay now in a tmr or a heavy concentrate feeding scenario you know i really i think people are are, are wasting their time if you're only feeding two or three pounds of, of feed um, because you're not moving the needle something else is going to be the determinant of the, the performance of those animals you can do that for the sake of getting them bunk broke, for the sake of gentling them down, for the sake of seeing them every day. But, you know, be realistic with yourself as to what your goals are when you're feeding that level. Now, if, I'm, if I've just received a set of calves on my place and I was going to get them bunk broke and get them started in either, like I said, a heavy, a heavy concentrate supplement or a TMR situation, I'm going to try to get them to eat a percent of their body weight. I'm going to put a percent of their body weight out on day one and hope to work them up to where they're, um, you know, if they're, if they're, if, if I'm graining them heavy, I'm going to work them up to a, a percent and a half of their body weight in, in concentrate or in grain a day. If I'm feeding a TMR, I'm going to try to get them up to that two and a half percent of body weight. Um, you know, one common, you know, kind of pushback that I'll get from producers is that I, you know, it seems like I'm asking them to feed a lot more than they're expect, they expected to feed these calves. But if you think about it and you go back to the to, um, you know, an expectation that these calves are going to eat at least two and a half percent of their body weight under a free choice access to feed scenario, one percent of body weight is less than 40 percent of their expected feed intake or dry matter intake is what TMI stands for on this slide. It's a very safe level. When I get cattle in the feed yard, cattle of unknown origin, I typically will start cattle on a 50 percent forage, 50 percent concentrate diet. I have no problem with an animal being going abruptly from 100% forage to 50% forage, 50% concentrate. If I get much above 50, that's when I go into the transitions and the step ups and the kind of, you know, taking my time getting them onto a, a hotter diet, as we might say. But if I'm going to go from zero 
grain to 50 grain or, or concentrate, I have no problem, okay? The way to manage these, these, this feeding management is, you know, like I said, start at a percent of body weight and every day that they clean up feed, you know, increase the amount of feed that you offer them by a pound per head per, per day. And, you know, try to get them to eat a percent and a half of their body weight and supplement your grain if it's a heavy, a heavy supplement scenario. If it's a TMR, we need to get up to two and a half. So, um, you know, and, and it's really dependent on the mix as well, because if you're, let's say soy holes are your best deal feed stuff. Soy holes we know have, you know, 20% less energy than corn does. If, if it's a low starch, a safe feed like a soy holes, like a gluten, uh, something that's, that's a little lower in energy but low in starch, you know, we probably need to get them to eat close to 2% of their body weight a day in, in supplement or in grain. Now, I want to I wanna take a little, a little detour here and talk about some work that Dr. Robbie Pritchard did at South Dakota State a number of years ago. And this is when we get into a TMR situation and we talk about bunk management. Okay, so this is assuming that we're going to feed them every pound of feed that they're going to eat. We're not giving them free choice of hay. You know, in a dry lot bunk management scenario, those calves need to eat 12 to 8, or they need 12 to 18 inches of bunk space per head so that they're, they're not crowded at the bunk. Everybody has a chance to get up and eat all at once. But Bigger point that I want to make, and I would say this is the most one of the most important takeaways, is that filling up the bunk when it's empty, empty is no better of a scenario than if you were to self-feed these animals, okay? And so Dr. Pritchard very eloquently showed this in a, a set of calves a, a, a few years ago, um, a couple decades ago, actually. And so he took two groups of calves, or a group of calves and split them in two. One group of calves, he basically used bunk management, used the, hey, I started them at a percent of body weight and I worked them up. And I only fed them what they would willingly consume. And I only increased it when they cleaned the bunk up. That's what you see in that figure two, lot A there, okay? In lot B, he simply fed these calves whenever the bunks were empty and he filled the bunk back up, basically. And you'll notice there's a pretty dramatic difference in the, um, groups in the in the, the 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 line graphs over time you'll notice that you know lot a there they got up to you know above 20 pounds now this is this is in a finishing example so i just want to make sure that you're aware so that is pounds of feed on the left this is a finishing scenario but the same principle applies if we're backgrounding calves and feeding a you know a lower energy kind of a growing type tmr you know, he got them to 20, and then you'll notice that their intake always stayed there pretty close to 20. It, it never went too far above. It never went, you know, below 17, basically. But in this scenario over this, you know, 55-day period, the calves that he only filled the bunk up when it was empty, you'll notice these calves' intakes, you know, they went up to 25, then they went down to 10, then they went to 20, then they went to zero. And you'll notice over time, you know, while it looks like these, these cattle might have consumed relatively the same amount of feed, you had one, two, three, four, five significant reductions in dry matter intake. So let's look at the performance of these, these cattle at the end of this deal. Um, in terms of cattle performance, this is the, the data from that, those two graphs um, on the backside. So example A, example B, or lot A, lot B. So lot A ate 20 pounds of feed a day and they gained 3.78 pounds of, of weight per day with a feed to gain of 5.35. Example B, well, they only ate half a pound per head per day less than lot A. Their average daily gain was 2.07 and their feed to gain was 9.5 pounds of feed per pound of weight gain. And so tremendously less efficient. Bunk management is a critically important component of successful cattle growth. And I think that's, that's, a, that's a real missing piece for a lot of, uh, of small producers. Now understand again, and I've said it several times already, this is in a um, TMR type scenario. This is not, hey, a little bit of supplement that they're gonna clean up in 30 minutes or an hour. This is a, this is a, a TMR example for anybody who's thinking about that, that type of a management system. I, I, I can't stress enough how important a set of scales are and good record keeping is and bunk management and is in a, in a TMR type situation. Um, you know, this is just an example here. You know, you really want all these cabs in the pen to be up at the bunk at the same time and eating in this type of scenario. And 
you know this is you don't have to have this this level of system to to be successful you just got to have the cattle at the bunk okay um i'm going to stop right here actually i think we've got a couple of minutes still but just to, to keep us on on schedule i i have more slides than i have time to to talk about so um anita I think this is a great stopping point. I'll, I'll go ahead and turn it back over to you and we'll pick back up here in the in the second talk. Thanks, Eric. Um, anybody got any questions? I haven't had any in the email yet. Uh, feel free to type them in the chat box. We got a couple minutes left before we move on to uh, facilities. And, and we will hear from Eric again uh, later this afternoon. <clears throat> All right. Well, uh, we'll we'll keep the chat box open, um, and we'll start with our next talk in two minutes at eleven thirty. Uh, so in the meantime, we'll just. Uh, let this be a, a short break. Um, go fish a Trulicity uh, thing out of the fridge and put it on the table. The box is on the bottom shelf on the right. You got your mic unmuted there, Joe. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> you couldn't before or could? I could. Uh, <laughs> oh. That's all right. That's the great thing about these Zoom meetings, isn't it? I wonder why it's doing that. All right, well, I have 1130. Uh, Joe, if you would like to start us off uh, on our facilities discussion, I'll turn it over to you. Come on. Okay, can we see the slide all right? Looks good to me. And you can hear me fine. Good deal. All righty. Well, good, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Joe Zolovich. I'm an extension ag engineer with University of Missouri. Uh, I've been around <clears throat> quite a while. Um, I started my 29th year with University of Missouri Extension here uh, earlier this month. So, um, <clears throat> so beef backgrounding 101 uh, on the equipment side. Uh, I thought I'd do a little bit on, on what we're hoping to cover here, a little bit of my background or philosophy and how it fits with um, the, the other presentations we've been doing and, and how I think about things. Um, <clears throat> Going to give some basic equipment facility information, kind of like, a, if you will, a data table, uh, if you will, a planning data uh, information on some things. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit about cattle behavior uh, in the sense of uh, uh, moving moving animals and then as far as handling facilities a bit on traditional facilities and then uh, low stress livestock handling or if you will the bud box kind of system and then some basic uh, beef confinement facility information that um, <clears throat> uh, uh, can get us started uh, from there. So given that, if uh, you got questions that come up, uh, feel free to put them in the chat and uh, we'll pick them up as we go or we can catch them uh, later. 
one of the things that um, from a bit of philosophy background is effectiveness of a beef system or a beef housing system uh, from that from that standpoint and as an engineer the effectiveness or how well it does and so from a definition perspective I think about the system effectiveness it provides necessary conditions for good cattle performance and the, the thought here is is that why would you invest money in anything if it doesn't help provide conditions necessary for good cattle performance and so the, the whole idea is, is what can we invest in from a capital perspective that is going to help us get done better uh, what we're trying to accomplish. And so some of the things that can be, can be around uh, group size and space provided, you know, what, you know, how many animals are you working with, size, that kind of stuff. Uh, feed and water access, we'll talk a little bit about. Uh, resting area, space, and bedding surface. Uh, not going to mention much, but that typically ties with facilities. Uh, you could think about resting area or pasture systems. You know, are you dealing with muddy conditions in a lot or something like that can have an impact. Uh, ventilation and structures uh, from an indoor air quality and a thermal modification. Uh, from a beef facility standpoint, you know, if we keep things opened up, it's not too much of an issue. Uh, manure removal and handling, once you start concentrating animals, regardless of type, you've got that opportunity to, to deal with. And then uh, on pasture systems, you've got fencing, you've got shade, you've got the water access issues that you, that you have um, to, to look at. So it's a, you got to look at everything and how it, how it ties together. Now there are some management or operational preferences that I think are very important. Um, establish what equipment or tasks are desired. So in other words, what are you kind of trying to get done? Oh, and overall, I should have said beef housing instead of dairy, ho uh, dairy housing design, but concept is the same. You know, what are you trying to accomplish and, and work through from there? Uh, probably the, the thing that's maybe more important is to leave out any equipment components or tasks that are not desired. And just from a human nature standpoint, if undesired components or tasks are included, effectiveness of a system will likely decrease. And what we're really talking about there is if you don't like to do it, you're probably not going to get it done, whether it's important to do or not. And so you know, the labor efficiency and some of those kinds of things are what you're willing to do, or more importantly, what you're not willing to do, uh, I think are critical to incorporate into your, into your <clears throat> design standpoint. And then uh, from a management intensity perspective, um, do you have the skills, the time, or the ability to run the system as, as required? And can and will a housing system component be operated and maintained as as required? So the thing that um, that's important to realize is that um, <clears throat> uh, you you've got to think about the labor available. Um, I mean, Eric talked about feeding. You know, if it's saying you're feeding twice a day and you've got an off-farm job as uh, uh, Wesley indicated, you know, maybe the ability to do chores once a day is really all you got. So you've got to set up your system to to function that you're going to do chores once a day as opposed to uh, something that's maybe twice or three times a day kind of thing. And then for the most part, in many cases, we're looking at a balance between capital cost and labor quality and quantity. Um, you know, there's a... There, in any system, and I deal with all types of livestock, uh, animal systems, uh, there's, a, there's a continuum many times between capital cost and labor, quality and quantity. And um, I mean, you can do everything by hand and it can be pretty cheap with a shovel. Uh, but, um, you know, how much does it take to get done and, and go from there? So that's some philosophy kinds of things. The other thing that's um, uh, critical is uh, with, with system effectiveness 
and uh, looking at siting, design, construction, operated and maintained. And so they're not necessarily uh, in numerical order, they kind of work together. And some of the pieces that you need to, to tie together, this operation, operated and maintained, uh, that brings in the op management preferences. So we talked about the operation and maintenance uh, needs to be done. Uh, so if there's certain things that you don't want to do or don't have the ability to do or don't care to do, don't believe in uh, from an operation and maintenance perspective, don't incorporate it into the design. And that's just my philosophy on that. Uh, when you're looking at a site or a certain operation, there's certain constraints that come from the site itself. Uh, how much pasture do you have? Do you have uh, wooded areas that can serve as shelter in, in, in bad weather? Uh, you know, what do you have available? If you're looking at a new facility, you know, what's the site? Can it be naturally ventilated? How well might that work? And then once you roll in the operation and maintenance, you can design it. So then you have a total system from a standpoint of uh, taking advantages of the site the management desires, what you need to accomplish, and then you construct it according to the design. And so that's kind of the, <clears throat> the overall system or concept from, from that perspective. All right, <clears throat> enough on the background. Let's get into some nuts and bolts here. Uh, some basic equipment, facility, information. And uh, <clears throat> this is... Uh, uh, <clears throat> Uh, a table that talks about bunk space, inches per animal, and it, and Eric just talked about some of the things of um, of bunk space from his perspective on the nutritional side. And when you look at this, you know, think about feeder calves, four to six, four to eight hundred pounds. You know, Eric was talking about that eighteen inches of bunk space minimum per animal. Um, and really, he was talking about once a day feeding. And, uh, you know, that, you know, if you're hand feeding in a bunk, a small amount of concentrate, probably once a day is what you're really looking at. Uh, twice a day feeding, if you if you have the ability to do that, uh, you might be able to, to slow that down, but, um, uh, you know, shrink that down a little bit, but uh, chances are you, you need that 18 inches to make sure it, it happens. And then, you know, from a, a self feeder, uh, you've got the different uh, uh, inches of space per animal. So if you've got, uh, you know, a 16 foot uh, self feeder, eight foot on either side, um, you know, that'll, that's going to drive how many animals it can be um, looked at. Self fed roughage, you know, how big is your bale ring? How, how many head do you you know, can you think about putting around it from there? So, so as the animals get bigger, the space allocation uh, goes up, and that's that's consistent uh, for beef cattle. Uh, and you know, if you look at what's on the dairy side or even on the swine side, uh, poultry a little bit, but uh, primarily the cattle, the the, the livestock side, uh, you have a gradation. So this is nothing new. Uh, but this gives you a sense of, of how much space you need to be providing based on the management and system that you're looking at. Water is, uh, is an interesting one that um, uh, I, as an engineer, probably talk about uh, more than probably most engineers would uh, because of the challenges with it. <clears throat> and not so much challenges, but the assumption that it's just going to happen. And... <clears throat> So I've divided some things up here on, on water needs by animal size and system. And, um, you know, if you look at um, uh, what's here, that's inches, uh, or got to look at what's happening. So if you look on this first row column here, it talks about animals per drinker. So if you actually have a drinker space, uh, something like that. Um, the idea on lot animals, uh, you're looking at up to 25 animals of feeder calves per drinker space. 
uh, pasture system you you see uh, 18 if you go over to bread heifers the lot 20 uh, 15 and if you go down here to animals per foot of accessible tank and that's really how how much perimeter around the water tank do you have available and how many animals per per thing and what you start noticing a pattern here is that lot animals versus pasture the density or the intensity of uh, uh, stocking rate is much lower for pasture systems than for lot systems and it's like you know this is an older reference that I pulled this from the Midwest Plant Service um, beef housing and equipment handbook um, been around a long time but uh, the interesting thing with that is my experience on the dairy side between uh, if you will freestall barns and and uh, rotational grazing pasture-based dairy systems uh, the need for uh, <clears throat> providing water space and pastures is different and the 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 real thing that you that you've got here is animals uh, cattle are are uh, uh, social they do follow a herd instinct and when the uh, the boss animal or the lead animal in the group decides it's time to go get a drink a whole lot of the rest of them will follow her follow that animal over to the water trough and I'll get a drink. So therefore you, you do have the, the need, if you will, to provide more space um, to, to let them drink. And the idea is, is that the, the lower, the animals lower on the social, social totem pole, uh, hopefully can still get a drink before they feel like, whoops, I got, I don't want to get left out and uh, go back out. So that's part of this issue with the uh, the differences between lots and pastures, and I think it's important to to point that out uh, from that standpoint. The other piece of the puzzle is uh, how much water use gallons per head per day uh, <clears throat> for animals, and um, wanted to point out the issue of hot weather versus cold weather and how fast can you deliver that water and things like that. And so here you're looking at, um, you know, if you look at your 1,000 pounds or 1,300 pound cows or bred heifers or whatever number, you know, you're looking at, in a sense, double the water use in the summer versus in, in cold weather. And <clears throat> that's not uncommon uh, across all species. Um, and so you need to be able to do that. So how large is your water tank? How fast are you delivering? Uh, there is some indication that for hot weather drinking that you really ought to be able to provide all the daily need in, in potentially up to a four hour period. Um, so now all of a sudden how you size your, your summer water delivery system uh, to keep up with the drinking demand that you're that your herd may have can be fairly significant. Um, and it's not hard, it's not extremely difficult to do. Uh, it's just simply making sure you've got your water line, your water delivery pipe size big enough to deliver the flow rate that, uh, that you might have. So those are some things from a water needs perspective that are there. <clears throat> um, from a basic design standpoint, uh, creep feeder design. I uh, wasn't sure whether um, uh, <clears throat> how much uh, the, the creep feeding with the cow calf situation um, <clears throat> from there. Uh, so here's a little bit of information on that. You do want the feeder protected from rain. Uh, obviously, you don't want the feed to get wet. <clears throat> the idea is, you know, a week supply of feed is. Uh, is what you'd like to do, um, and I'll I can let Eric comment on some of the uh, the the concentrate mixes. Um, are there some problems with feed freshness uh, in hot and humid weather when we get our you know our nice sultry um, uh, summer summer humid uh, hot summer conditions uh, in July August uh, where we have you know, temperatures in the mid 80s to mid 90s and, uh, you know, dew points, I like to follow dew point, which is 70 to 75. 
uh, which in essence are tropical type uh, climate conditions. You know, in the afternoon, we're talking about relative humidities and 50, 50, 60 percent in the evening that our nighttime lows are barely getting under 80 degrees, 75, something like that, that um, we're looking at. Um, you know, how many calves are you looking to accommodate? Uh, the thought is, is that four to six inches of trough space per calf, as well as uh, looking at some sort of uh, fencing uh, used to restrict cows from accessing the feeder. The idea is, is you're providing for the, um, for the uh, calves and not necessarily to, to supplement the cows. <clears throat> Moving on then to um, <clears throat> beef handling facilities and then again a little bit of background from the handling standpoint. Now in this, uh, in this situation uh, we talked about system effectiveness uh, providing for good cattle performance. Here we're looking at can provide conditions necessary for safe and efficient beef cattle handling. And some of the uh, health <clears throat> uh, kinds of things that um, uh, that uh, Dr. Payne talked about as far as that and, and implementing those health programs and those kinds of things is really the, the situation here. <clears throat> and um, so really the case is, you know, do you have a system set up to safely and efficiently handle the cattle that you have uh, and, and go from there. And there's some, there's a number of different options that can be looked at from there. <clears throat> Again, um, uh, you've got your des site design construction operated maintained issues, uh, just like we did with, with anything else. And, uh, you know, when designing a beef handling facilities, the operation and tasks to be completed you know, again, must be incorporated in the design phase, just like we talked about earlier, uh, is what you need to accomplish uh, needs to be rolled in into the, to the design phase. And so from a functionality standpoint, there's a really good um, uh, resource from University of Kentucky that, that I've, that I've uh, depended on. And um, it's one of those things where uh, having access to a solid publication, I've not really looked at getting something uh, duplicative for University of Missouri, but um, you know, you've got your, your different um, uh, components, if you will, uh, whether you have a loading chute incorporated, a scale, uh, you know, it could be, in, uh, you know, a scale to put in the system or size or or maybe a side thing, some sort of um, uh, queuing up system. A crowding tub is is what's typically talked about, or we'll talk about some other, another system here in just a bit uh, from from that standpoint. But this is kind of the flow of uh, animals uh, and 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 how you need to to pull things to pull things together. When we look at an overview of cattle behavior, I think it's important to, to understand how the, um, how the animals uh, react to uh, you as a handler next to them. And these are, uh, this has been, you know, uh, shared for a long time, you know, in many ways, and, you know, there is a blind spot be behind the animals and, um, uh, if you're thinking, you know, coming up from behind them to uh, to have them move, they can't see you, so they don't know. And then all of a sudden, if you get too close and they get startled, you can get get kicked. And um, so, really, coming up from uh, from that uh, shaded area here, uh, in the standpoint of of uh, this dark shaded area, your handler position. Uh, uh, how you position yourself and, and, and go from there. If you move too much forward, um, you know, the balance point, they'll turn around and, and go back the other direction. So actually coming from the side and a little bit to the back uh, is, is a good way to, to have them move this edge of the flight zone. Um, you know, that's how, how, how tame they are. Um, 
you know, I've heard said, well, shoot, I can't get within 10 feet of my animals. Well, that's the edge of the flight zone and dairy cows, you can get within 18 inches of them before they hardly move. But if you come up to them in this dark gray, dark shaded area, uh, their flight zone is such that, you know, they'll start moving. And so it's an interesting thing to remember that where you position yourself uh, to, to get them to move. And then, um, you know, working with uh, animals out of, out of a pen on how you, how you can position yourself to, to sort animals out uh, from there and where you want to be to empty the pen um, from, from that standpoint that they, they'll move forward. And so those are just some, some basics, basic kinds of things to, uh, to think about as you, as you pull your system together. Some other things that are important to realize is what, what causes animals to not want to move um, from that standpoint and some of the details that you want to, to avoid. Um, shadows are one of those things where um, they're just not going to do that. Uh, they can't see, um, something changes, you know, the bright spot versus the dark spot, uh, these kinds of things. Um, I mean, if you've not been in that, in a situation, if you're not familiar with what that all is, you know, you're probably not going to want to move quite as fast as if it's a well-lit hallway to, 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 to go from. The other thing to be careful of is uh, something that changes the, um, in this case, the alley. Uh, we have a drain here. Well, it looks like a line. What's, you know, what's there that's going to cause that. So keeping the the ground uniform and visually uniform is what what works. Another piece of the puzzle that I um, uh, need to be aware of or careful of is animals for the most part, cattle included, don't like to go from a lit area to a dark area. Uh, so if you've got your, your, your working facilities that you're taking them, trying to uh, chase them into a dark air, dark space, if you will, compared to a bright sunny day outside. Um, you know, I mean, they're just not gonna, they're not gonna be that interested in, in moving that effectively. So you gotta watch your lighting. You know, dark to light tends to be, uh, work pretty well, but from light to dark areas, uh, not so much. So those are just some things to, to be aware of uh, incorporating in your, in, your, in your system. I'm going to talk, talk some now about uh, traditional cattle handling facilities uh, from an overview. And what I'm thinking about there is you've got, you know, the crowd tub where, yes, you're working with the behavior somewhat, but you're also pretty much saying, okay, here's here's the only way you've got to go and you're gonna go that way uh, regardless of what you think. And so the crowd tub is, is kind of that philosophy. Um, you know, sometimes depending on the temperament of your, your animals, uh, this is the only way to kind of handle that. Um, but this is a good, uh, a good resource uh, uh, picture to, to think about on, on how the, the, the different components can be pulled together and so forth. Uh, looking at uh, specifications, and this is from that uh, University of Kentucky publication on, on recommendations, um, <clears throat> space per head on a holding pan, um, you're looking at space per head, 14, 17, or 20, just simply because uh, 20 square feet per animal, just simply because as they get bigger, they needs more space. Uh, your pen fence height, pretty much all the same uh, from that standpoint, just a case of, uh, of what's your density. So depending upon what size animals you're working with, uh, a given size holding pen is gonna have a different capacity. And so you need to think about, you know, what size animals am I tr typically going to be using? How big is my typical group going to be uh, from that standpoint? And then uh, size your pens accordingly. Uh, your crowding pen, um, you know, much, much tighter uh, kind of thing. So it's all, again, you know, whatever size uh, pen you have, that's going to drive how many animals uh, you can put in it. So these are some basic numbers 
that have existed for a long time um, from there. <clears throat> Some of your facility components. Um, again, like a working chute, if you got a straight-sided one, um, the, um, the inches, the width, if you will, uh, 18 to 28 inches, again, depending on, on how big, uh, tapered, uh, different kinds of solid uh, kinds of things. So it gives you a sense of, of how big things need to be, uh, depending upon your animal size, uh, or how you might need to maybe have it adjustable. If, it, uh, if you can adjust the width, say on a straight side shoot, working uh, smaller animals versus larger animals. So you put your posts apart so you can go 28 inches and maybe have a, a false um, or an adjustable uh, wall that you can go from there, which, um, you know, if that's something that, that, that sounds acceptable to you as a way to, to handle that. Uh, your squeeze chute, again, uh, similar kinds of things with, you know, the biggest thing is, is that's consistent about these uh, cattle handling uh, facility specifications is the smaller animals typically have somewhat smaller dimensions in certain cases than uh, the larger ones. And that's, you know, almost um, pretty, pretty much that you could uh, just, you know, it should be fairly straightforward because of the size of the animals. Uh, the loading chute, <clears throat> again, um, uh, the sizes, not a lot of difference there uh, on, on that. So that is one, one advantage. The width, 26 to 30 inches for your larger ones, uh, 26 inches from, from that standpoint. Uh, the thing that um, uh, minimum length, uh, minimum rise. Uh, so if you think about this is uh, 12 foot of length and uh, rise inches per foot. So if you take and multiply uh, three and a half inches by 12, you've got a 42 inch um, uh, truck load height uh, that you could potentially have with this minimum length and maximum rise. So that gives you a sense of uh, what's there. Uh, if you do have it uh, steeper than that, it is a little more challenging to get the animals to to walk up, uh, you know, a steeper hill than a than a, a, f a flatter one. So this kind of gives you a sense of um, of what you need on as far as a loading chute uh, for for trucks. Another option um, to to look at from the standpoint of uh, of animal handling and uh, this uh, bud box con uh, concept and. Um, it's, it's an interesting one where uh, the originator, Bud Williams, um, who, who had uh, years of experience with traditional crowd tubs was like, you know, there must be a better way to, to do that. And so um, <clears throat> these are some things that, um, that uh, the foundation of the layers uh, uh, from that standpoint and the mindset and the attitude of the handler uh, has a lot to do with it, understanding what the animal's behavior is uh, is telling you or well, how they're reacting has an important part uh, and then and then uh, working working through uh, those those kinds of things and so it's a it's it's really uh, you know low stress livestock handling there's quite a bit of information out on the out on the internet uh, from different places uh, from that standpoint. And, um, you know, the, from the standpoint of handling, uh, the conventional crowd tub concept is that cows are dumb, brutes, uncooperative, unwilling. Uh, you have to physically uh, work with them and they're difficult to work with. Where on the low set is, you know, Cows do have some uh, smarts to them, if you will, or some understanding of what you're trying to do. Uh, you can 
basically think about how to do things and, 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 and go from there. So the, the concept that you can train animals, uh, you know, show animals are trained and uh, from that standpoint that you can work them uh, from, from that standpoint. So it's a, it's a flip-flop in philosophy uh, that goes from, you know, having a system that there's only one way to do it and that's the way you're going to do it and that's it uh, versus, uh, you know, work with the behavior of the animal. So um, <clears throat> uh, some 12 steps to success or uh, for, for low stress livestock handling is keep the animals in a normal frame of mind. Uh, you know, don't get them riled up, uh, get them scared, whatnot. Uh, when uh, Wesley talked about his, you know, his fence disappearing on his lot, uh, something didn't go right, and um, you know your your system wasn't strong enough to withstand the forces. Um, animals should not be forced to do anything they don't want to do, or they're not ready to, and that's one of the things that. Um, uh, having grown up on a dairy farm and, and, and moving dairy, dairy animals around, and I understand there, you know, I know there is a difference. Um, you know, dairy animals tend to be a little more docile uh, most of the time, um, but I've also been chased out of a pasture from a, a dairy cow that just had a calf. So you got to be careful. Uh, you set up every situation. The idea is, is that uh, let it be their idea uh, from that standpoint. The other one is, is they want to avoid pressure. They need to experience uh, release from pressure, trying to push them. If they're not ready to go, uh, give them a chance to look at, see, smell, sniff, whatever they think they need to do to, until they're ready to, to move. Uh, they want to be in a herd, so separating them out uh, individually is, uh, you know, uh, go from there. Uh, this is one where um, a trick we used to use is we've um, uh, actually uh, one animal doesn't doesn't want to go back into the barn. Go get a couple couple of cows that you know are pretty docile and kind of the boss cows and. Um, have them go out with with the uh, scared heifer and get get the two or three together and they'll just walk right into the barn because you know the scared one has got a partner to go with uh, move in a direction they're headed you know they want to keep going the direction they're going they'll they'll do follow the leader um, uh, very well the cow path in the pasture is a good example of the follow the leader um, Good movement attracts good movement. You know, get them going good. They'll keep going. Uh, they want to see what the pro, you know, what's pressuring them. So they've they've got to see you, uh, what you're trying to do, and they want to see where you want they where you want them to go and and go from there. Um, <clears throat> they'll want to go by you or around you. So that would be an excess pressure. Uh, if you get them, you try force too hard, uh, they'll turn around and want to go back the other way. And that's just, that's just their behavior. And, and so if they're trying to turn around and, um, and go from there, uh, uh, you know, you're pushing too hard. And a quote by Bud Williams that I think kind of sums it up is the way we move, how we move, and where we move to are important to communicate with the animals. If you move properly with the animal, they will respond properly. Where you position yourself is everything. And it's a really interesting uh, how well these principles will work uh, from there. And so one of the things, the basic uh, design of a bud box uh, concept is that you have a, an entrance on this side and you close a gate, you open it, oops, you open a gate here and the animals, they get a dead end. They see, oh, I can't go that way anymore. By the time they figure out they can't go that way anymore, you've got the gate closed, you've got this open, they'll turn around and then head out the exit uh, from there. And so that's uh, pretty straightforward. Um, <clears throat> I've done a little bit of, uh, 
uh, cost kinds of things. And my intuitive impression is that this kind of, uh, of animal handling system is probably less expensive than the, um, uh, the fancy crowd tubs and those kinds of things. Uh, but um, your animals need to have uh, experience and exposure with um, that you've worked with them and, and people have been around them and they're not scared of, uh, of those kinds of, kinds of things. So that's kind of the concept behind that uh, from there. And, and there's more information available if, if need be. Last topic I want to talk about is some of the basic uh, beef confinement facility information. Uh, if you are thinking about or might want to consider why would you put the cattle in a building, uh, you get a day like today in lush green pasture, it's hard to beat. Um, but, uh, you know, Wesley talked about adjusting your, your windows and, and are you in a situation where um, uh, to take advantage of market, um, you don't have the, um, <clears throat> the ability to uh, uh, have uh, outside scenario. Uh, from that standpoint, and and there's a lot of di different things. And what's interesting of my experience here in Missouri is, uh, you know, the shift that Wesley talked about in the in what's happening in the last few years uh, since 2017. Uh, I would concur because that as an engineer, I've had more interest in the last uh, three four years on beef confinement facility information that I've had in the prior 25 years combined. And so it's an interesting shift that I think we need to, to look at closer to see what's going on and how can systems be put together. But if you want to look at uh, some of the basics, um, <clears throat> uh, 40 square feet per head on a bedded pack, uh, kind of the, the common concept uh, you'll see numbers range from 28 to 50. And it's interesting how some of those things are pulled together. Uh, 25 square feet per head on a slatted floor <coughs> tends to be the, um, the, the, the limit. You'll notice it talks about 12 inches of fence line bunk per head. Well, one of the things that you need to be careful on that is uh, probably feed, you know, this, this is probably assuming you're feeding at least twice a day as, as indicated. And so you're looking at that, you're probably looking at a total mixed ration of some sort. Uh, a 12 to 14 foot uh, height uh, so is critical to look at from the standpoint of removing the bedding, adding bedding. You're going to have tractors or skid loaders or whatever front end loaders to, to, to work with. And um, so you don't want to be getting the equipment into the superstructure of the, of the building. One of the things you may want to, um, <clears throat> to really uh, do a paradigm shift, if you will, uh, when you're looking at cost comparisons, is the fact of, uh, of looking at dollars per square foot as opposed to dollars per head. And depending upon what the density of the uh, space is, um, you know, the idea of going from 40 square feet per head to 30 square feet per head, all of a sudden you can change the cost per head of the building um, or what it appears to be simply because you crowd more animals in uh, compared to something else. And so those are some things to, to kind of get you started. Um, from the standpoint of uh, uh, confinement and so allow for summer and winter ventilation, uh, really the uh, an open, open facility, um, <clears throat> Really what you're trying to do with a, a facility for, for cattle, um, beef cattle and dairy cattle the same, is to protect from the wind and keep them dry. And um, you keep <clears throat> beef cattle dry and from the wind, um, you've got better feed efficiency, uh, feed conversion because they're not using the energy to maintain body temperature and fight off the, the cold, wet uh, situation. 
uh, <clears throat> summer openings. Uh, I did have the insulate for condensation control only. Um, so the idea is really, um, you're not insulating to keep the barn warm and it's just uh, uh, what you want. You know, there is the thought that uh, insulation will help uh, with condensation control in the winter from a ventilation perspective. My experience has been if the ventilation is adequate in the winter, condensation is not a problem. Actually, some insulation under the roof line is actually more beneficial from my perspective for summertime and thermal, um, thermal control um, acts more like a shade tree than, uh, than a hot metal roof uh, being exposed down, down through from there. So those are, <clears throat> those are some things. Uh, one other item that um, I'll just comment, um, comment on as I as I close is um, there there is uh, in in Missouri the um, the winter feeding floors that um, uh, the soil and water districts have promoted along with uh, NRCS and do have some cost share programs and there's the idea where you have a simple um, simple facility you use primarily during the winter uh, or the bad weather months where you can provide uh, feed to the animals, supplemental feeding, uh, and a shelter uh, for them to to hide when it's uh, you know your your cold rainy weather. Uh, there's nothing more miserable, in my opinion, than a for a 35 degree day with a with a slow steady rain. You get soaking wet, uh, and then you freeze. Uh, from that standpoint. So those are some things from that standpoint that I share. So if anybody has any questions or whatever, uh, here's my contact information if you'd like. And uh, right now I'm between you and lunch. So I'll turn it back to uh, uh, Anita or if there are any questions. Thanks a bunch, Joe. If there's uh, any questions at this time, uh, go ahead and send them. Otherwise, we're going to uh, take a 15 minute break for lunch. Uh, since everybody's at home, we're uh, or thereabouts, go right to your kitchen, get fixed up, and then we'll start back up here. All right, I'm not seeing any questions coming through, but I'll keep the chat box going. All right, we got about two minutes before we get started, and uh, this will be our final presentation. Uh, Dr. Eric Bailey will be speaking on the second part of nutrition that we had scheduled, and then at 1.30, we'll begin our uh, Q&A panel with our speakers and Jack Harrison. Hey, Anita, let's check my mic before we get started. Sounds good. How's the, how's the sound level? It sounds clear on my end. I have my volume turned all the way up on my computer, though. Okay, I might I might turn it up just to hear more. Just let me know if it's uh, if it's uh, if it gets a little excessive. So okay, turned it up a little bit more. How's that? That's great. Okay, no big deal. Not not like I'm screaming in your ear. All right, I have 12.30, so hopefully everybody's made it back to their computer. Uh, Dr. Eric Bailey, if you would, start us off with the second part of our nutrition talk. All righty, well, thank you, Anita. So what I'm gonna do is finish up the, the last couple of slides from that first presentation and then 
really where I'm taking the second one is more of my experiences in backgrounding, preconditioning, running stalkers, and, and kind of sprinkling some management in with the nutrition, just so everybody's aware. Um, talked a lot about feeding and, you know, like a typical nutritionist, it kind of made it sound like I wanted y'all to spend a lot of money on feed um, earlier on. And the, the second part of that, that first talk that we didn't get to was really, you know, the grazing component. Now, in terms of grazing, you know, we can dream up a num any number of, of forage resource resources and scenarios, cover crops, warm season grasses. You know, there, there's a, there are a tremendous number of forage options out there. For sake of time today, however, I really want to focus on the number one resource that we have in Missouri, which is tall fescue. I have quite a bit of interest in, you know, fescue management. A lot of my research program is, you know, how we how we utilize fescue here in this state, and you know, really in particular how we utilize Kentucky 31 or endified infected tall fescue in in our in our beef cattle production systems. Um, Wesley talked about this a little bit in his first pre in the first presentation this morning, but. You know, there's there's some interesting scenarios when you think about the 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 forage yield curves in tall fescue, where you know in the spring we often have more grass than we know what to do with, and we end up using that, and you know, or we end up not using that at the time that it's actively growing vegetative at its highest quality, but instead we stockpile it and then we'll cut it for hay and feed it during a period of time when our forage is low, but. You know, I, I think the thing that I, I, I'm, I'm working through right now in terms of research is, you know, what's the, what's the potential of some of this K31 fescue for us to grow cattle on? Um, there's some real benefits to it because if you let the animals harvest it, you put weight on light on young calves, you, you have less input or equipment in terms of, you know, hay and steel and fuel and labor and tractor, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, there, there's potentially some real possibility where we could, we could, you know, make a, a more sustainable system and a more profitable system in the long run. Um, you know, grazing tight in the spring also can suppress seed head production in, in K31, Kentucky 31 fescue, which may, you know, help us reduce some of these fescue toxicosis problems we see during the summer slump. And I, I think it's important, though, to understand that I'm not advocating for us to graze pastures to, to zero in, in April or May or anytime, you know, in the spring, because anytime we get pastures grazed down where that forage height across the whole pasture, the average forage height across the whole pasture is less than four inches, we limit the intake of that forage by, by the grazing animals, by the cattle in this case. So I want to share with you all now some results from a, an experiment that I have going on in uh, Mount Vernon at the Southwest uh, Research Center. So what we did is we've got 96 steers and they're turned out on, uh, we've split them across 16 different pastures. Now there's six steers in each pasture, the four acre pastures, okay? And they're turned out on a, um, a really toxic stand and by toxic, I mean endophyte infected. So this is 88% endophyte infected Kentucky 31 fescue. Not a lot of clover, not a lot of other stuff in, in, the, in the stand, pretty much a straight tall fescue stand. We turned these steers out to graze um, each of the last two years, we've turned them out April 18th. And what I've got here are the results from the, the 2019 grazing experiment. We're repeating it now again in 2020 just to gather more data. And what we tested in this experiment was, you know, essentially three different pasture or four different pasture treatments. Okay, a negative control where these cattle were out on these pastures for 60 days, basically, with no, no amendments to the soil, no, no herbicides, no nothing. Um, we used a, a metsulfuron-containing herbicide, Chaparral, the specific brand name, um, as a mechanism for suppressing seed heads and tall fescue. There's been a, a lot of really good work come out from back east in Kentucky in particular that shows that you know, use of chaparral and tall fescue forage systems improves average daily gains in, in stalker cattle. But then we tested that against using no nitrogen, 60 pounds to the acre of nitrogen, or 120 pounds of nitrogen to the acre. Now it says 67 and 134 because I've got that expressed at least in kilograms per hectare there and I forgot to change it over. 
And so the, the one of the challenges with chaparral is that, you know, you're typically going to see a, a, a slight reduction in forage yield that the literature would suggest about a 30% reduction in forage production when you use um, chaparral, but greater gains. And so unfortunately, what most had tested in the literature was chaparral with, with no nitrogen. So we simply just wanted to, to uh, use some nitrogen fertilizer in the spring and see if we could sustain similar cattle gains or you know, if we, we, we know that there's a relationship between the amount of nitrogen fertilizer that's produced and the um, endophyte producing what we call ergot-like alkaloids or the specific chemical compounds that cause, you know, these, these fescue toxicosis symptoms that we see. And as you can see here across our treatments, that first month um, average daily gain, you know, we ranged from 2.2 pounds in the negative control uh, all the way up to 2.66 pounds of, of gain per day. Now understand, we, we basically, there's zero supplement. These cattle continuously graze the exact same four acres the whole time, so really no grazing management either. And um, we stocked it at a, at a, a five weight, there was 1.5, 500-pound steers per acre, okay? So um, now what's interesting is that You'll notice, so April 18th to May 17th, you know, gains well above two pounds a day, no supplement. In from May to June, we actually ran out of forage in our in our Met Zero, or our chaparral with no nitrogen treatment, and had to pull those cattle off two weeks early. Okay, so it would support our our hypothesis that you know we were going to see less forage yield when we do chaparral without any nitrogen. But by adding nitrogen, we were able to sustain um, enough forage availability to continue to graze those. Met 67 and Met 134 steers out. However, you'll notice that the gains in um, from May to June were approximately you know 40 percent less than they were from April to May. But overall, over a 60-day grazing period, you can see that we got at a minimum of 1.9 pounds of average daily gain across the the treatments that we were able to graze for the entire 60-day period. Okay, and what, what I think is really interesting about this is that for a long time we have talked about tall fescue and how horrible the, you know, stalker and, you know, growing calf average daily gains are on tall fescue and all of the things that we need to do to, to sort of, you know, accent or augment or supplement, you know, tall fescue just because it's not, not, not a, a, a viable forage resource for our, for our growing calf programs, but, you know, I, the reason that I'm doing this project and the reason that I have so much interest in this is I was actually trained at Kansas State University. And out in the Flint Hills of Kansas, they learned a long time ago that with their tall grass prairie, historically that's always been yearling country. We turn cattle out in May and we bring them in and we take them off of those pastures in October. And you know, typically this kind of six month, 180 day, 180 day grazing season uh, you'll see that in Osage Hills in Oklahoma. You'll see that in the Flint Hills in Kansas. And, you know, a long time ago, some, some uh, scientists got to, got to thinking about this 180-day program, and, and, and they started asking the questions, well, we know that forage quality is really high early on and that forage quality is really poor at the end. And so what they did then is um, this, this table is directly out of actually an Oklahoma State publication, extension publication, the link is at the bottom. And it's a comparison between a, a season long stocking and an, an intensive early stocking system for stalker cattle. Now, the difference between a season long and an intensive early stocking system, it's the exact same land area, but you've got twice the number of cattle out there for half of the number of days, okay? And so you can see there from May 1 to September 30th versus from May 1 to July 15th. Okay, so you've got 75 grazing days instead of 150 and you've got, you know, 100 steers instead of 50. We know that the, the summer slump is profound in Missouri. And we know that, you know, once tall fescue switches from vegetative to reproductive, it makes stems and seed heads forage quality drops a lot. But a lot of the old stalker research in Missouri used more of a season long stocking kind of a concept and looked at ways or strategies to, to sort of battle that summer slump. The question that I'm asking these days is, you know, what if we, what if we, we know we've got a flush, we, we've got a flush of grass in the spring, we've got more grass than we know what to do with. Could we develop an intensive early stocking system in Missouri 
that sort of looks like this the intensive early stocking in in Kansas and Oklahoma and and, and it be a net positive for our for our farmers now a couple of things right offhand that's big blue stem little blue stem Indian grass native tall grass prairie they're all warm season grasses they've got a different growth curve I I, I totally grant that that's 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 not arguable so it, it wouldn't look exactly like a May 1 to July 15th kind of a deal in in Missouri <coughs> excuse me what I think we could do is probably something where we turn out you know somewhere between April 1 and April 15th especially in the southern part of the state the northern part of the state might be a little different just based on on climate and we graze from somewhere um, till you know June 15th to July 1 where we might get a little bit on the front end of the summer slump but not horribly and the question is can we put enough weight on these animals to um, you know make the juice worth the squeeze in this case you know we put a just shy of 100 and, 120 pounds on uh, cattle I think it was like 111 or 112 pounds on these calves with zero supplement on 88% endified infected fall fescue in 60 days, okay? Um, this year, we're repeating it again. I have the first month of data. Um, gains look excellent again from April to May. Now, we'll, we'll, we'll see how it all plays out. We're gonna have to continue to do this project though because you know, if you all think about what kind of year we've had so far, we've been cool and wet. We've had um, nearly ideal clover growing conditions now. Granted, there's not a lot of clover in those pastures, but you know the reason we repeat these studies year in and year out is just so that we can understand what the consequences are of doing this over a longer period of time than, hey, it worked great one year, so let's everybody you know load for bear. Now, I wanna show you all some performance in this sort of intensive early stocking system, at least in the tall grass prairie. So this is TBD in Missouri for, for sure. But when they did the, um, they compared so the stocking density essentially of twice the season long stocking for, for half the time or even 3x the, the stocking rate for um, the for half the time. You know, steer average daily gain was about 2.2 pounds. Importantly, the gain per acre continued to increase. And so you'll notice that the heavier they stock it, the it, it doesn't enhance individual animal performance, but it instead enhances the overall productivity of the land, the pounds of calf gain per acre. Now, we're purely at the speculation, or, or if you're wanting to call, be optimistic, the hypothesis point, but I hypothesize that, you know, in the coming years, we could, you know, you could see my research program take a pretty hard look at, you know, what a, an intensive early stalker system might look like in um, on Kentucky 31 tall fescue here in Missouri. And, you know, I, I hypothesize that we might see something relatively similar to this. So, so that's, that's about all I'm going to say about, about stockers and grazing at this point. Um, I'm going to kind of get out of the, the, you know, the nutrition part and go into what I call the, the lessons I've learned running backgrounders, preconditioners, and stockers. Okay. So this is the, the second talk uh, of the day. And Really what we're gonna do is we're gonna kind of break it up by section. Um, we are going to look at preconditioning and then we're gonna look at backgrounding and you know, time permitting, we'll, we'll hopefully get through all of these. Okay, so lessons that I've learned from preconditioning. Just to give you a, an idea, so my entire PhD uh, research program was on preconditioning. Over the course of seven years, we took about 3,000 head of calves that were born on one of two ranches in, in Kansas, and we preconditioned them, we shipped them to a sale barn, we ran them through, or at least we held them on the premises of the sale barn overnight, and then we shipped them to a, a feed yard, okay? And then we continued to follow those cattle all the way through finishing and harvest, and we evaluated how the preconditioning, various preconditioning programs influenced um, you know, the overall system performance, for lack of a better way of saying it. And I would tell you that, you know, based on the, all the, that data that I, I looked at, you know, I, I personally consider preconditioning programs to be sort of the pinnacle of best management practices for cow-calf producers. Preconditioning works extremely well if you've got all your ducks in a row on the cow-calf side, okay? Now, what do I mean by best management practices? And, and you know, 
there, there's three of them on this slide right here that I think are tremendously important. And that first off is defined breeding and calving seasons. If you're um, operating with a, a bull turned out year round and you're taking calves off, you know, um, as they get of age or as you need to sell one or something along those lines, you know, that's, that's a that's a little bit different system than having a, a defined breeding season, a tight calving window, and you know being able to manage the animals as a group. Um, are these calves have they been exposed to vaccination? Have they been castrated? Have they been worked prior to weaning? Um, that's an indicator to me if you're regularly doing this already that you're probably going to have some success going on and actually holding these calves for a period of time after weaning and. You know, the other thing is in terms of body condition score management in your cow herd, how are your cows staying in flesh? Are, are, are you seeing wild swings in body condition over the course of the year? Are you having to feed a lot of hay? Do you have thin cows? Are your cows in good shape? You know, all of these things, if, if your cow-calf operation is, is well-managed and, and everything is good there, preconditioning is probably going to work pretty well for you. Now, people who, who haven't quite got all of their cow-calf stuff lined out yet, Dump, jumping into a preconditioning program with both feet is probably going to be a risky proposition because it, you know, you might see scenarios or situations where, um, you know, you don't have the, the, the calf health or the calf performance that you would, that you would like. Now, I want to show you an example of this from Missouri here and what I mean. So, Eldon Cole, who is, you know, quite frankly, a legend of University of Missouri and University of Missouri Extension, has been putting together this Missouri steer feed out for a long time. I want to show you some recent results from the Missouri steer feed out. Okay, so in the Missouri steer feed out, producers send small groups of, of animals, five to 15 head, um, from their farms to be fed at a feedlot up in Iowa. Okay. And what he saw in 2019 was the per head profit or loss is that the worst groups lost $470 a head, the best groups lost $41 a head. Now, understand that if you're looking at small groups of animals, certainly having one death or one realizer, a calf that you know you have to sell before harvest for poor performance or health, um, you know, can really influence the profit in a single group. And so you, you know, you can kind of explain some of that large variation with that. But what you look at, if you look at the data closely, you know, there was more variation in profit or loss across the 30 groups than there was variation in profit or loss among individual animals within each producer's group, meaning that the well-managed groups, they all did well. And the, the groups that quite frankly, you know, you could have there was room for improvement in terms of management are probably the ones who had, you know, animals that were profitable and animals that, you know, were realizers or, or deaths. Um, it just gives me at least some ind indication that, you know, we have some, some room for improvement in cow-calf management in this state. Okay. So how to make a, a if you're going to go down the line of a preconditioning program, how are you going to make this thing work? I will tell you that the number one thing I learned from preconditioning 3,000 calves as part of my graduate research, the number one thing you can do is to spread stressful events out over time. Okay. Now, stressful events. Let's let's just kind of work through a list of these. The most stressful event that a bull is going to face, a bull calf is going to face when you um, castrate them. The second most stressful event that a bull calf is going to face is when you separate him from his mother. Okay, the you know another stressful event that's going to happen is you know tran transport long distance. If you're going from the ranch of or farmer farm of origin to the to the sale barn or to the feedlot, um, you know significant diet changes can be a stressful event in and of themselves. The more that you spread these these events out over time the less overwhelming it becomes to the animal. Um, it's not an all or one deal like you see the preconditioning programs. Do all of these things and you have a chance of getting a premium at the sale barn. We didn't try to, to shoot for premiums in any of our preconditioning programs. We tested things as how long should we precondition them um, to, to reduce morbidity in the feed yard. I'll tell you that in, in our cattle that we tested, 
this with, which we four of the years that we four of the seven years we were testing essentially the length of preconditioning period. We cut morbidity during preconditioning and in the feedlot by two thirds when we wean those calves at least two weeks before we did anything else with them. And by that, I mean shipping them to the sale barn or to the feedlot. And so we didn't need the whole 60 days to have a positive outcome. The, the simple way that I, I like to say it is that, you know, if you can get the ball out of calves before they go somewhere else and give them a chance to kind of get over that stressful event of weaning, you're probably going to have a pretty profound impact in their, their life going forward. You know, castration, that's a pretty obvious one. We, we had castrated all of our bull calves at approximately 90 days of age. So, you know, we never really tested that in the system, having to castrate them in the middle of weaning or preconditioning or at the feed yard or anything like that. Um, you know, and then vaccinating against the, the, the BRD complex pathogens like Dr. Payne talked about, it, it, it's important. Um, and just to go back to my earlier comments about Mark Hilton's work with preconditioning programs is the money's made by keeping these calves for a longer period of time and getting some weight on them. The, the money's not going to come from the premium at the value added sale. The money's going to come from selling heavier calves in that sale. Okay. So another topic when we think about preconditioning is that there's no right answer in terms of the ideal day to wean a calf within its life. I would tell you, however, that there is the ideal day to wean a calf based on the conditions on your farm, and that that's going to be different every year, relatively speaking. You know, I, I we weaned calves at as, as early as 100 days. We weaned calves as late as, you know, eight months old in, in all of our experiments. You know, and you think about a 100-day-old calf, that's, that's just a little over three months old. Weaning is a very, early weaning is a very powerful destocking strategy um, if pastures are short or if we're facing drought-like conditions. Um, I want to show you from the cow side why this is so important. Now, I went to the University of Nebraska's beef reports and pulled this paper off by Kleminsky um, from 2002. This is weaning date for spring calving cows grazing Sand Hills Range. Okay, so they weaned a set of calves off of their cow herd at the Sand Hills um, every two weeks starting August 18th all the way through November 24th. Okay, and as you can see the, on the y-axis, we've got the cow's body condition score. Now it's in a one to nine scale here. Okay, and remember, we always try to talk to producers about staying somewhere between five and six on the body condition score scale. Every two weeks that they weaned those calves, later that they weaned those calves, took a quarter of a body condition score off of those cows. Okay, so they took in two months, they took those cows from a six to a four, basically, or, or three months. I excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, the point that I'm trying to make, obviously, so we're talking sand hills, we're talking mixed grass prairie, completely different forage type than in the fescue belt. We don't have the data that I'm aware of at this point in the fescue belt of spe fescue specific examples. But if you think about, you know, a situation where perhaps you are, you know, the summer slump is quite profound and you're running short on grass, let's say August 15th or something like that. We know that a, a fall flush of grass is coming, but the question is if your cows really start to get poor, does it make more sense to sort of partially destock by weaning those calves, bringing them in and feeding them up to the weight that you'd like to sell them at? sparing some condition on those cows or, you know, letting those calves stay out there and continue to, to nurse those cows. Um, so, you know, the, the, the argument that I'm making here, or the thought that I want to put into your mind is that if forage quality is poor, when you, when you put weight on nursing calves, when, you, when nursing calves continue to grow, oftentimes that weight growth comes at the expense of the body weight or the body condition on the cows themselves. And so you're just trade, you're robbing Peter to pay Paul for lack of a better way of, of saying it. Okay. And so this, this is a, a busy slide here. This is actually from a paper that I published back in 2015. It's cited below. Um, we weaned calves at, you know, either um, 100 days, 115, 130, 145, or at 160 days of age. So these all, these calves are all early weaned. 
Um, you'll notice that across the top it says length of weaning period is zero to 60 days. So this is the length of the time that we precondition them on, one, on either of the two ranches before we ship them to the feed yard. I don't want you all to get lost in the p-values and all of the data that are on there. And certainly anybody who wants to study this closer, I'm happy to share the slides with. What I want to point out to you all is the morbidity. Even in the group that had the greatest amount of morbidity, morbidity means diagnosed with sickness, um, we had 3.74% out of 400 calves, um, you know, 12 calves that we doctored for something. We got along extremely well in terms of health. And, you know, we didn't list mortality because we quite frankly didn't have it. We can use early weaning as a tool, a drought management tool, as a body condition savings tool, we can actually, and if you look here, I know it's in kilograms and I apologize for that, but it's 2.2 pounds for every kilogram. You know, we got these cattle to gain 2.2 pounds. Now we fed them a TMR in a dry lot and it, it, was a, it was a good TMR. I don't have the economics on here on it, but you know, we also got those cattle to perform. And importantly, we spared body condition on our cows. So, Let's move on to the, to the backgrounding and stalker component of this. Okay, so what I'm gonna show y'all now is a, a closeout. So a closeout is essentially a final report on the performance and, and you know, even the, the, you know, the costs and revenues of a, of a group of animals, okay? And so I'm gonna show you a closeout now from a real life Missouri background operation. I, I, I'm, privilege to work with some really phenomenal operations in this state and I'm I'm not going to disclose the name or or location of the of the parties here but I've I have used one of their closeouts just to kind of work through a, a real life scenario of what somebody might invest into a calf in a backgrounding operation okay I know the slides a little small I know the fonts a little small I I really hope you can see this but I'm just going to, and there's a lot of stuff, it's kind of busy. We'll, we'll, we'll walk through this kind of slow and we'll just go um, from there. And so essentially 128 head of heifers that were brought onto this farm in November of 2019, they were shipped to the feedlot in March 1st of 2020. Um, there was 129 that were received originally. We, these would have been small lot cattle out of various sale barns across the state. They were on feed for uh, 104 days, and there were some cattle that moved in and out, so that's why that average days on feed is a little lower than 104 days. Um, the cattle were bought weighing 575 pounds. They were sold at you know just shy of 800 pounds. Okay, so these cattle gained about two and a half pounds per day, which is um, below. They ate about 17.6 pounds of dry matter per head per day. Now you'll notice that it says deads in or deads out. And so, you know, deads in assumes that the feed that any animal that died would be counted against the entire group deads out. The feed that was put into any animal was not counted against the entire group. Okay. And so, you know, you can see that these cattle gained two and a half pounds a day. They ate 17.6 pounds of dry matter. And if you jump over to the bottom left, they gained, or they, they took about seven pounds of feed per pound of gain. Now, given the cost of the feed, was, which was $80 a ton on an as-fed basis, or $138 a ton, they, it, it cost this producer about 48 to 49 cents of, in feed per pound of weight gain. Now, overall though, when you factor in, so cost of gains includes just more than the feed. Cost of gains includes your, your time and your labor, your overhead. It includes, you know, interest on feed, interest on cattle. It includes, you know, vet and medicine costs. It includes, you know, a number of different things. So that, that feed cost of gain is competitive, but you'll notice the overall cost of gain, they were putting a pound on these calves for about 85 to 87 cents, depending on whether you did deads in or deads out. So, you know, you compare that back to the value of gain that Wesley got. Now, this is, this is a dry lot TMR uh, type of operation, just so that you all are aware. Now, I, I don't want to disclose a lot of the financials, just, you know, for, for you know, respect to, the, to the, the producer. But I wanted to show you a breakdown on a per head basis of how much they invested into these cattle in the different areas. So this is everything that would have gone into those cost of gains. You know, they spent about $107 in feed per head. 
they had about seven, almost $8 in interest in the cattle. They had, you know, 67 cents in interest in feed. Um, they spent about $30 ahead in veterinary and medicine costs. Now, understand that these producers, because they're buying cattle from in small groups from sale barns, every animal will receive a, um, an antibiotic at arrival on this farm. So what we would call metaphylaxis. And uh, along, in addition to vaccines, in addition to um, dewormer, um, they would re have received a low, low potency implant. Um, um, other costs, trucking, um, that was just the cost of, of movement and then the yardage. So the yardage that this producer charged his, his the cattle for sake of, of covering the overhead on, his, on, on their place was they charged those animals 50 cents every day of yardage or overhead. Now, that yardage, you can see over that period of time, you know, over the 87 days, that's about $43 in, in yardage. So, you know, that one might not necessarily be like a real cost for a, uh, the average producer, but in a sense, that's a cost of, that's the value of, of, of your time. You know, some people will do yardage that's 30 cents a day. And quite frankly, I think you're working for below minimum wage if you're doing that, you know, um, you know, 40 cents is a, is a pretty common number that's used as well. This producer is just, you know, he's using 50 as a, as sort of a hedge to, to, to put more money back into the facility. So just some real life examples here that I, I happen to be able to share with the group today as you, as you kind of think about some of these, some of these uh, potential programs or systems. Just for a reminder, one more time before I move on, this was a backgrounder, a dry lot, TMR um, system. Okay. Now, another thing that I've learned over the years, you know, as it comes to um, these types of systems is I really don't care for letting calves dictate how much grain or concentrate they eat, or really even hay for that matter. But I just want to focus on the, the grain or concentrate at this point. You know, there's a lot of people who have used steer stuffers or creep feeders over the years to, to allow animals access to to grain or concentrate you know whether or not the the to, to support or or accent the you know the nutrition they're getting from their dams and the pastures or from the pastures or trying to finish cattle i want to go back and take a take a look at a, a creep feeding example because that's probably closest to what you would see if you were trying to do a self-fed deal on a uh, let's say a grow a young light growing calf versus a self-fed steer stuff or finishing kind of deal okay so this is a this is a publication from kansas state that was generated down at their southeast research center in parsons kansas on endified infected tall fescue um, calves were actually fed creep feed for 120 days okay so a little longer than we what we might consider traditional now by creep feeding these calves for 120 days they increased weaning weight from 393 pounds up to 511, or an additional 118 pounds of weight gain, okay? Which increased their average daily gain by 3.6 pounds, or I'm sorry, 0.36 pounds per head per day. But it took them 1,000 pounds of creep feed per calf to get that additional 118 pounds. And so when you divide that 1,013 by 118, you know, you come up with a creep feed feed to gain ratio of 8.5, okay? So, which that that's a little higher than the example I would have showed you on the backgrounder, not, not terribly much higher, but give you an idea of how much money you have to spend on creep feed if you're gonna go down that path. Now, I wanna talk about a couple things, a couple of myths that I see quite frankly in the, in the, um, the, the creep feeding space. The, the number one myth that I see is that a lot of folks say that creep feeding spares body condition on the cows. And that's, that's just, I don't believe that to be the case. So this is an experiment that was done at the University of Illinois back in 2004. Um, it was published in the Journal of Animal Science. They measured the forage intake, the creep feed intake, and the milk intake of calves that were offered essentially three different level, four levels of creep, none. 1.3 pounds a day, two pounds a day, or 3.3 pounds a day. The thought process here is that if you offer creep, potentially the only way that it positively impact the cow 
is if the cow produced less milk or the calf drank less milk. In this example, though, there was no influence of um, creep feed and access to creep feed by the calves on the milk production by these cows. Okay, so they milked these cows manually and then fed the, the milk to the calves every two weeks for, um, I believe it was, I think they did it four times. So it had been over an eight week period. This was about a 56 day creep feeding. So the cows didn't produce any less milk and hypothetically the calves would have drank that milk. This milk was, was fed to the calves afterwards and they, they cons readily consumed the entire amount of milk. They didn't leave any behind. But you'll notice instead that when we creep fed the, they creep fed these calves, the, their voluntary consumption of forage went down dramatically. Now they weighed out the amount of feed that they offered these calves um, in, a, in, a, in a creep gate system where the cows didn't have access to it, only the calves were going to be able to consume this forage. Um, you know, it, as you can see, as we increased the amount of creep feed that the calves had access to, forage intake went down. And, and it's interesting, if you look at it, the low level of creep feed, if you add the 8.36 and 1.28, that actually adds up to 9.64 or more feed than the calves that had no creep and were only consuming forage had access to. And so you could make an argument that that's a net positive. But if you add the medium together, you're at 5.7 plus 2.02, .02, you know, that's 7.74. That's lower than the 9.02 forage intake to no creep. And the 3.37 plus 2.2 .2 is 5.57. That's, you know, that's 45% less than the, the no creep calves, the amount of feed that those animals ate. Now, no argument, you know, this, this would have been fescue hay. This was pretty common, you know, not great forage. You know, the creep feed was a, of a greater nutrient concentration than the, the forage itself. From this, the conclusions that I could draw is that you could say, hey, my pasture's a little short. I don't want to wean those calves, but I'd like to, I'd like to reduce a little bit of pressure on the pastures. That, that argument makes some sense. The question is, does the creep feed pencil relatively, relatively speaking, but to say that it directly will spare condition on a body, on a cow, it, it, it's a little bit of a stretch because the cow's still making the same amount of milk. Okay, and I'll, I'll show you, um, so this, that, this is the same paper, but they, uh, a separate experiment, the larger experiment where they measured this on a cow herd basis. So they, the calves in this cow herd were offered access to creep feed for either zero, 28, 56, or 84 days, and um, this is the cow's weight change over each one, each of two years of the experiment and the body condition score of these cows at the end of the grazing experiment. And the red numbers mean negative. And so essentially in all treatments across all two or both years, cows lost weight during this period. These were spring calving cows. This would have been during the height of the summer slump. But you'll notice that the weight change was eerily similar among all of the treatments in both of the years. They all lost somewhere between, now that 19 at the bottom of year two sticks out relative to the rest of them, but the rest of them lost between 36 and 59 pounds. And you'll notice in terms of body condition score, there's no difference in the body condition score on a one to nine scale. And these cows are actually pretty poor, relatively speaking, you know. Um, they were poorer than we would we would ideally like them to be. But you'll notice that you know, body condition score ranged from 3.7 to 4.1. It was a very tight window. We didn't have a significant influence on, you know, the amount of condition on these cows when we offered calves access to creep feed. Okay. Now, a couple of other, that if, if we're going to fine tune the system, there's some, there's some technologies out there that I think are worth mentioning. If you're, if you're trying to optimize a growing calf system, you're trying to make it work. How do we, how do we do that? Okay, well, there's two tools that are out there that I consider to be, you know, just absolute, one, what I call grand slams. And, you know, for your baseball terminology, a grand slam is a home run with three runners on base where you score four runs. And so I call them grand slams because, you know, there's consistent data out there to suggest that they return to you, you know, at least $4 for every four, for $1 that you invest in each of these tools. Okay, and I'm going to show you some data now that would, that, you know, points out the, the importance of them to your, to your potential, you know, growing calf system. Okay. When I talk about ionophores, there's really three that are out there. There's rumensin, bovatec, and there's catalyst. Okay. 
Now, this is some data that's got a little age on it. It's uh, manensin and cattle performance when consuming forage based on the amount of manensin that the animals. Manensin is the active ingredient in the branded product rumens, just to clear that up, okay? And so you'll notice that, at, you know, they tested 0, 50, 100, or 200 milligrams of manensin per animal per day, and they fed them hay in uh, a dry lot just to be able to measure um, forage consumption, okay? Average daily gain went up from you know 1.09 pounds per day when they offered them zero manensin to you know 1.29 pounds per day when they had 200 milligrams. Um, we we all recommend so like rumensin has clearance to be fed up to like 360 milligrams per day in a stalker growing calf system and up to 480 I believe in a in a feedlot system. Most will recommend a dose somewhere between 150 and 200 milligrams per head per day. Um, it looks like, you know, in this case, and, and really across the literature, we see about two tenths of a pound a day increase in average daily gain um, when, we, when we add rumensin or monensin and ionophores, all of the ionophores for that matter, to, to these diets. Um, no effect on feed consumption, but you'll notice, at least if you compare the zero and the 200, it took two less pounds of feed per pound of calf gain. So you went from the zero monensin calves requiring 13.9 pounds of feed for every pound of gain to the 200 milligram menensin calves requiring 11.9 pounds of feed per pound of gain. And that's how ionophores work is they actually change the, the microbes in the rumen, they change the populations a little bit to make them make it more efficient um, in the products that they produce that the animal then ends up using. Okay, so how do you get these into your calves? How do you incorporate them into your operation? Well, I, I should say the first thing to know is that they're probably gonna cost you about three and a half cents per head per day. If you feed the ionophore for 100 days, you're looking at spending about 350. Now, if you get two tenths of a pound of day average daily gain greater over a 100 day period, that's an additional 20 pounds of weight. And so, as you can see here, you know, if I spend three and a half bucks to get an additional 20 pounds of weight gain, even with a you know a value of gain that's different that that takes into account a price slide, you're probably looking at a at a profitable um, management decision. Now, ionophores are usually found in mineral supplements, in protein pellets, mineral blocks, branded feed products. You know that's something that you're going to have to work with your local co-op, your feed dealer, whomever you buy feed from. That that's the best way to get them in. This isn't something that you should mix on your own unless you, you feel really good about your mixing capabilities. This is something that would be better off to just buy with in a, in a, you know, a branded product or in a supplement of some kind. Um, the only thing I would tell you to make sure is that if your, your feed, the feed dealer knows that if you're, 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 you're feeding a, an antimicrobial in the feed, so you can see something along those lines, they need to know that you're doing that with these calves because of the, um, the need to disclose that, you know, not every feed additive that's regulated by the FDA can be fed in combination with every other feed additive. And in particular, the use of chlorotetracycline, which is an antibiotic, and rumensin, at least as of, to the best of my knowledge today, is not allowed. However, the, the feeding of Bovatec in combination with chlorotetracycline or CTC is. So, um, you know, common name for CTC might be oreomycin um, or products like that, you know, so, so essentially the antimicrobials, the antibiotics, the feed antibiotics, and these ionophores, you know, you got to be careful there. Okay, so let's talk about implants. Now, this comes out of some work in New Mexico State that was done. Um, this is actually suckling calf implant. The reason I chose this was this was the easiest data for me to get my hands on. If I'm backgrounding calves for a short period of time, I'm using a lower dose implant, much like I would the suckling calves. You know, there's, there's really kind of two levels of implants. There's the low dose implants for grow, young growing calves, and then there's the, the high dose implants that are used for, for fattening or finishing cattle. And so, you know, the implants that are used on the calf side would be relatively similar to the ones that we would use on the stalker backgrounder you know, the younger calf side. So it, it, it's a reasonable uh, comparison. And this table just shows over five years what the difference in weight across the, um, the um, 
implanted and non-implanted calves were and what the difference in value of the non-implanted versus the implanted calves were. And so if you look at that five-year average, okay, they used one specific product in, in this example. They got about addition, an additional 18 pounds of calf gain per year over the five-year period in suckling calves by implanting them. And that additional 18 pounds of calf in terms of value per head, these animals are worth about $9.65. Now I'll tell you, they spent, they spent around $3 a head in um, their implant costs. And so, you know, you're looking at a three to one, 3.2 to one return on investment in this case. So maybe not quite that four to one grand slam that I said earlier, but, but definitely in the ballpark, you know, these, these pay. Now let's talk about implants because implanting is not something that we typically do in the cow calf side not not because we shouldn't but because we just you know we just it's not a common production practice especially among smaller producers who don't work calves okay so implants are intended to be implanted in the middle third uh on the back of the ear um you know you've got your needle insertion site in that picture right there um you've got the cartilage ring there i put a link to a Oklahoma State publication about implants that I think is is really important and I, I I really like the publication. It's not that I'm trying to promote other universities' content. It's just I don't feel the need to replicate this or duplicate the efforts here in, in Missouri. Um, you know, one of the big questions about implants that comes up is actually the consumer acceptance of it. And this is not the most scientific example of this, but I felt like it was the most striking example. And I pulled this off of a website called Find Our Common Ground, measuring hormones in food, one M&M &M at a time, okay? And so you will hear people say that implanted beef has 40% more hormones than non-implanted beef does. And they are absolutely right. I I'm, I'm just being completely forthcoming. However, if the difference is half an M&M &M versus, or one M&M &M versus half an M&M, &M, a 50%, a large increase, is that really relevant in the grand scheme of things? What this picture shows you is how much, and this is estrogen specifically, how much estrogen is in a three ounce serving of beef, how much estrogen is in a three ounce serving of potatoes, how much estrogen is in a three ounce serving of peas? How much estrogen is in a three ounce serving of cabbage? Okay. And so, yeah, so if we go from half an M&M &M to three quarters of an M&M &M or half an, or three quarters of an M&M &M to a whole M&M, &M, it's a drop in the bucket, relatively speaking, to other food options that humans voluntarily consume. And in particular, when we look at some of these plant-based foods that, you know, seem to be deified by a certain vocal minority um, out there. People, people have concerns and qualms about these implants, but you know, I'm here to tell you that, that we shouldn't you know, you know, knock a tool just for not a lack of understanding about it or for concerns over you know, consumer acceptance, especially when it could be you know, potentially a, a $3 return for $1 investment or a $4 or whatever that, that in, might end up being. You know, I, I think that you know, across the state, we could do a lot of good if we were willing to to look at you know the use of implants you know in stocker backgrounder operations which those those folks that are actively engaged in the biz, those businesses are currently doing it it's the cow calf people and it's the people who are going from cow calf to other other ent business entities that that might be a little bit reluctant now implants you know we we shouldn't implant females that are going to be intended for breeding we that's something that's been talked about for a long time um, you know, there's, there's good data out there to suggest that, you know, the performance of a um, bull that's not castrated before six months of age is the same as a bull that, that is castrated at some point before six months of age, at least up to weaning time. You know, so there's no real reason to delay castration to try and make a heavier calf when really what if we castrated the calf and put an implant, uh, you know, a, a a Rao grow implant, a Cinevex choice implant, uh, you know, a low dose implant, we could probably get some, you know, an additional 20 pounds of weight gain on those animals just doing it. You know, that that's that's a it's an underutilized tool that's that's available for us to to be 
um, to improve our operations. Okay. And so, you know, I, I know those are kind of scattered thoughts and I'm finishing about 10 minutes early, but I thought that that would either A, um, give us some time to get caught up. I was kind of expecting that uh, I, I'm, I got to compliment the Nita for running quite a tight ship and keeping us all on time. Um, here's my contact info, my email, my office number. Um, I would be happy to discuss any of this with you, to share any of my slides, to, to follow up, to do anything along those lines. Um, I really appreciate you all taking your Saturday um, to, to, to visit with us and to, to participate in this program. Really enjoyed my time and I, I'm sure looking forward to, uh, to opening it up and kind of having a, a discussion. So thank you very much and I'll turn it back over to Anita. Hey, thanks, Eric. All right. Um, we can actually, since we have everybody here, uh, Jack Harrison's here with me now, we can go ahead and get started with the Q&A and roll right in. I'd like to give everybody an opportunity to uh, ask Eric any additional questions over anything he just covered. All right. All right. Uh, so I'm going to introduce uh, Jack Harrison I have here with me. He is a sale barn owner here in Callaway County and uh, he runs his own backgrounding operation. So I asked him to go ahead and get started, uh, start us off with our Q&A panel by just kind of giving a little background on his operation. So with that, right there. Yeah. kind of what we do, uh, most of you know that I do run the livestock market here in Kingdom City. So we handle a lot of four and five weight calves we background just to kind of support my market a little bit. And some days it gets a little tough, so we kind of hold the market together. Buy quite a few calves and our program is kind of make them weigh eight to nine as yearlings and sell them back to our sale barn. Uh, kind of creates buying enters because we have load lots of yearlings. Uh, there's good times and bad times. It's been pretty tough the last couple of years to make make a lot of money doing it but uh, pro probably the best advice i have for you is buy them in the spring keep your dollars down graze them and hit the fall yearling market we can, we can always sell yearlings very well in this country from first of october to first of january uh, we do have a cow calf operation we keep quite a few cows and we make yearlings out of all our calves and try to get the biggest bang for the buck, but sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. That's kind of the background of our operation. We uh, do feed a lot of corn silage. You know, the, the key is to hold your uh, expense down the best you can, that, that, that's the key. Buy low dollar calves, but good quality. Don't spend a lot of money on them. Get them as big as you can with the least amount of dollars you spend. So um, at this time, if you got any questions or a topic you'd like us to touch on, uh, any one of our speakers, including Jack here, uh, put it in the chat box or you can email it to me. Um, I'd also like to offer our, our uh, speakers, if they have something they'd like to add, to go ahead and do that. We got a pretty quiet group here. Uh, <laughs> oh, here we go. Got here. All right, Ronnie asked, "Do you have any comment on the current situation with the Packers loss?" <laughs> yeah, uh, it's been a it's been a pretty tough ride here lately. Uh, what they've done is against every law that has ever been wrote, written in my opinion. And we just, we hope that the DOJ and the, actually gets in and does something this time. I've got another question. What type of risk protection does Jack use? We've been hedging some cattle. That has not worked very well lately, of course, but uh, what we do take risk management with, with hedging. We just short the feeder cattle and try to protect our margins best we can. We uh, have done some LRP in the past. It's gotten awful expensive. Uh, I'm not a big believer in that. I wish to, you know, when it first started, it was great because it was cheap and 
you could uh, lock a nice profit in and not have a lot of overhead. But it just seems like once it got started, uh, you know, I haven't checked on it for a while, but last time I checked, it was almost 50 bucks a head just to kind of protect your break even. I always thought that was a little too much. Any good questions? Based off feeder cattle contracts or using live cattle contracts? Feeder cattle contracts. Once in a while, I will ship to a fat cattle contract. But, uh, most of what we do is we hedge the feeder cattle. And how far out? <laughs> Every time I get over about four months, it costs me dearly. <laughs> Most time we keep our cattle about 150, 60 days. So when we're buying them in that 150 days, we hope we can get a window in there where we make a good profit and we'll, we'll short the board. Yeah, excellent questions. Uh, Eric, Joe, Craig, do you have anything you'd like to add on that topic? All right, Ronnie asks, are you running on anything other than fescue? Fescue is all we have. Uh, we do uh, graze a lot of rye through the winter times. Uh, most of what we do is we chop corn silage. We go fall right in there with rye, and we graze the rye all all winter. Makes great pasture. But uh, no, during the summer, that's pretty much all we have is fescue. And if you're going to background cattle, you cannot just graze fescue. It will not work. You got to you're going to have to feed them a little bit, not a lot. But they just got to have a little bit on the grass to make them gain. Especially during that summer slump. Yeah, especially during the summer slump. I do want to point out while we're waiting for more questions to come in, uh, as we talked about backgrounding and everything we discussed today, uh, there are some resources on the extension.missouri.edu website. Uh, just to keep it simple, you just go to that website, uh, Google Missouri Extension, however you want to do it, and then you just type in the search bar. You can type in backgrounding or nutrition or whatever the topic may be, and there's some publications. Uh, like Wes had mentioned, the uh, backgrounding budget that's on there so those type of things all right are we got any more questions i'm not getting anything in the email do you target medium and large ones or what is the best targets Yes, large ones is what we, we predominantly black cattle is what we handle, uh, large frame. The back in 14, when uh, the cattle got short, the packers used to really discount a fat steer over 1,450 pounds. When all that happened, all of a sudden they started taking 16, 1700 pound steers at the same price with no dock. So all my Iowa farmers that we sell the yearlings to, all of a sudden, you know, they, they want a 16, 1700 pound fat steer. And, you know, if there's no dock on it at a dollar 10 or 20 a pound, that's a lot of money from 1200 pounds to 1600 pounds. So that's kind of the change I've seen since then. All right, we got any other questions? Uh, any other thoughts from the speakers at this time? How do you feel about silvopasture when it comes to herds? 
So just some clarification on silvo pastures, uh, not necessarily wooded pastures. Uh, it's a little bit more to it than that, but in order to provide some natural shade, having uh, trees dispersed throughout uh, pasture. Uh, Cattle's got to have shade. There's no doubt about that. But we have some pastures. I mean, all our pastures definitely have trees. I do even have some uh, kind of pastures set up that are pretty much nothing but wood. And uh, granted, we probably feed those cattle a little bit harder than we do on the grass, but it works works real good. And you know that area is really no good for anything else. Any of the other speakers want to comment on that on the silver pastures? All right, um, our next question is, uh, what are you thinking the rest of this year looks like for beef producers? <laughs> Any thoughts? Where's your crystal ball, Jack? Oh, you know, uh, I feel very good about the fall, as long as we don't have another corona virus outbreak, war with China, if, if our world will just settle down, I, I feel like the fall is going to be pretty good. There's lots of ups. I know if Wes Tucker was on here, he'd say it depends. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we, we still have a big wall of fat cattle out there to get work through that, and then that really worries me. A lot of big cattle out there that aren't getting moved like they should be. And, you know, our, of course, everybody knows our box beef is way too high. So can we sell it? That's, that's a concern. Any other thoughts to add, speakers? All right, we got any additional questions to put in the chat? All right. Well, not seeing any other questions, I'll, I'll let this go through for a little bit longer, but I do want to take a moment to thank everybody and thank Jack here for joining us and appreciate the speakers staying on as long as they could and appreciate you guys. Uh, this format was a little tough to roll through it without any breaks, but uh, we got through it and doing it online is sometimes a little tricky, but um, again, appreciate your guys' time and your questions. And uh, I'll be providing the recording, hopefully within the coming week, so you can go to YouTube and check out what you may or may not have missed. So thank you all.